Okay, so, um, well, I wanna welcome everyone. Um, welcome all the presenters as well in our little Brady Bunch box that we have going on here. Um, and welcome everyone at home who's watching, hopefully safe in your couches, in your homes. Um, thank you for joining. Um, please do bear with us as we work things out. Looks like Brian, you've got it, thank you. Um, so, so my name is Lana DeFrancisco and I'll be introducing the presenters tonight. And that's a great honor and it's also comes with a lot of nerves. So maybe a little patience, obviously we've had some kinks to work out. Um, I'm a PK city organizer in St. Joe and Benton Harbor, Michigan. I joined in 2015. Our community has fully embraced uh, Pecha Kucha. We love it like beyond words. Um, it's just such a beautiful vehicle for sharing passion and hobbies and artwork and so many more things. If you know, you know. So um, <laughs> tonight we are streaming live. If you're watching, you're either on, uh, out on Facebook or YouTube. Um, and we are located all over the world. I am in Michigan. Brian is running tech from Tokyo. Astrid and Mark are in Tokyo as well. And we have a host of presenters from all over the world whom you'll meet tonight. And we want to thank all of you. Um, just to repeat, this is our second time ever doing this. So it's pretty brave of you to do this. Um, so yeah, we hope that you experience the joy and connection with PK in this new online version. Uh, again, the second time ever, we have an amazing design-centric group of presenters. And uh, in fact, one of my friends called this morning He's uh, works for Pepsi in New York. And he's like, do you even know who you're with? And he was talking about <laughs> Chantel Martin to say one of them. Um, oh, it's funny. And so, yeah. And so if you're new to PK, uh, each night is just like this, where a collection of presenters get together and they share their presentation in a very specific format. And I just moved around, um, which was devised by Mark Buell obviously no, and Astrid in 2003. Everyone will have 20 seconds and 20, uh, 20 slides and 20 seconds each. And tonight we have five presenters starting we'll take a short break and then we'll have five more presenters. And we'll end the e evening with a little Q and A or maybe a little round table. So in the comments of either Facebook or YouTube, Give some feedback, ask some questions. We'll circle back to those at the end of the night. We do have moderators checking all those messages. So of course, these are usually um, hosted live in unique venues around the world. There are over 1200 cities um, hosting PKs and um, tonight we cannot gather, right? Everyone's uh, pretty much homebound, but this is kind of a gift in a, in a surprise way where we have removed the distance of the cities and we get to see from people from all over the world. So it's quite a gift. And then um, if you like what you see and wanna start a Pecha Kucha in your own city, if you don't already have one, go to pechakucha.com and um, you've officially been nominated to go do that. And so without, um, my reading glasses, I will <laughs> share that tonight's presenters- Before mine. <laughs> thank you. Tonight's presenters are from Tokyo, Wuhan, China, London, San Francisco, Chicago, Orlando, New York. I might've missed a city. Um, this is a night to help inspire the world. And that is not just a phrase, that is an initiative. And Mark is gonna tell you more about that. Um, Mark Dytham and Astrid Klein are not just architects, they're not just the founders, but they're the um, brain, brain, it's the brainchild of them to start this campaign of inspiring the world. And that is how um, one, one way to um, spread the word and, and inspire the world about how to deal with uh, COVID-19. And so a lot of presenters have topics around that. And so, um, Mark, I think I'll kick it over to you. Thanks, thanks, Lana. Yeah. Thank you so much, and thank, I want to say a big thank you to uh, all the presenters that have, have joined us. Many, many old friends, some new friends as well. And uh, I also want to say a big thank you uh, to Brian 
uh, in the cap um, who is uh, looks after our Pachacha Global Network and has done a remarkable job pulling this uh, event off. Uh, there's a lot of technical stuff that goes on behind the backgrounds. And um, yeah, so we may be a little bit ragged around the edges. We're sorry about that, but um, I think the spirit is there. Um, it's obviously a very difficult mo moment around the world, uh, but we found out uh, with our other projects or other Inspire projects around the world that there's, there's so much creativity, there's so much pos positivity. And through this, these, uh, these presentations and these recordings, they'll be archived and put up on our website. Um, it's, it's a great way to catch the moment. It's a great way to catch all the information that's out, out there. And, um, you know, um, make, make sure this is archived for gen generations to come as well, yeah, as well as in the present. But anyway, without further ado, why don't I uh, try and start? I'm not sure if Brian's going to be able to play that for us. Uh, can you just go back to the Dezine slide? I do want to say a big thank you to Dezine as well. This is the uh, first day of their virtual design festival. Marcus and his team at Dezine have really stepped up to the mark as well because many degree shows around the world for, for architects and uh, artists, they can't have their degree shows. Um, also, Milan Furniture Fair, the Furniture Fair's design weeks around the world can't go ahead. So uh, Marcus has really stepped up to to the mark and put on uh, this virtual design festival which runs for um, a, a, a month or so and um, we're we're partnering up with them to help promote that as well today so go across to design we should be live across on design too I'll check that out um, I'll check that out in a minute when I finish my presentation but again th thank you to Zine and check out their website and their virtual design festival Okay, Brian. Um, I, I normally go at the end, but I thought it'd be polite today to go at the beginning uh, just to introduce uh, the Inspire project um, and also just to calm everybody else's nerves who's doing this on, online. So why don't you press that start button, Brian? <laughs> See if we work. Okay. Off to, over to you, Mark. Okay, so I'm Mark Dytham, and along with Astrid Klein, who's just sitting uh, across the way from me, um, we run Klein Dytham Architecture here in Tokyo. Um, we're architects, uh, that's our day job, and we run Pachacha Pachacha Night in the evenings. And I just show a couple of our projects to put uh, our work in context. Uh, that was Ginza Place, um, a multi uh, use project in the middle of Tokyo, on the most important cr crossroads of Tokyo. And this is a wedding chapel in uh, Japan. Um, it's designed like a wedding veil, so when the groom kisses the bride, he picks up the veil and then this veil swings open. It's perforated with 4,600 holes. 20 seconds goes quicker. So we ran this art space in Tokyo called Super Deluxe. And um, when we kicked this space off, we didn't have enough events. And uh, it was the dawn of digital photography and keynote on the Mac. So we thought to fill some of those des nights, why don't we uh, start a show and tell format? And uh, you know what architects are like, they talk too much. We wanted to see what other people were doing in town. But if you get one architect out there with a microphone, they'll talk about a handrail de detail forever. So we came up with this very simple idea of only showing 20 images for 20 seconds each, no forward or back, and that really made sure the presenters uh, were on time. And uh, there's a little bit of chit chat as we'll do between these presentations. And Pachacha Night was born. Um, Pachacha means chit chat in Japanese, it's an onomatopoeia, Pachacha, 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 so the sound of chit 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 chat. And um, yeah, we had a one-off event. Uh, immediately people were saying, when are you having the next one? We'd like to uh, sh show our work too. And um, it spread from a one-off event to an amazing 1,227 cities today uh, around the world. It's really an incredible uh, move, creative movement that we've uh, built, almost by mistake. We don't promote this. Um, one city sees it happening in the next city and it gets passed on. So it's completely vi viral and we don't charge for the format. It's free and I think that's really how it's spread around the world. Um, when we were in about 600 cities, there was the uh, earth, um, awful earthquake in Haiti, and uh, we sort of got together and wondered what we could do as a group. And uh, we're in touch with Cameron Sinclair, who will be speaking tonight. And we crazily had this one event, a global event that ran around the world and we raised $100,000 uh, for Architecture for Humanity and built, along with Ben Stiller Foundation and Cameron, a school in Haiti. 
um, a year later, the, um, the, 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 the shoe was on the other foot and we had the earthquake and tsunami in Japan. And here you can see that over 130,000 buildings were destroyed by the tsunami very quickly in the first 20 minutes. Really shocking. And I don't think people really do understand the scale of the, 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 the disaster still. We ran another um, inspire, or we started this notion of inspire. Japan's inspired the world with its design and we wanted the world to inspire Japan back. And we set up Inspire Japan campaign and we had another global event. Uh, and we just put a logo out and then people make these amazing posters. The creativity that comes out of our community is really amazing. We, we, we don't stamp the same, well, we stamp the same logo in the bottom, but we want people to show their, their regional cre creativity or their own artistic creativity. We had 105 events around the world one month after uh, the earthquake and tsunami. And uh, we raised another $100,000 for Architecture for Humanity. And along with Toyo Ito's Home for All um, pro pro project, and Nike, this sports center was a uh, bit built uh, for the children of Kesanuma. And so um, it's been a really uh, inspiring project. And I think we, we kind of end up being the last, Cameron always said that we're kind of the last responders. We still keep uh, recording uh, presentations about what's what's going on in, in this area. And if you go to our um, Inspire Japan page on our website, we have hundreds of presentations uh, about what just happened after the earthquake and tsunami or what's going on today, 10 years on. And so uh, we're really building this amazing archive. Um, and some of those presentations, uh, they might be about the temporary housing, the presentation on, on, on the left, um, somebody describing what it's like to live there. And then on the other side, uh, Safecast. And at Asby, we're talking about Safecast and their project uh, a little bit later. So it's really developing, it's really developed into an amazing archive. And then actually only, only a few, few weeks after the big earthquake in Tokyo, there was a huge uh, uh, um, magnitude seven earthquake in Christchurch. And Christchurch is one of our really strong Pachacha cities and we, we started an inspired campaign for them and again you can go to the website and see all the amazing presentations that are made about the positivity and creativity that's come out of this very difficult situation in Christchurch. And the projects um, expanded. Uh, we've uh, now run projects for Kumamoto, where they've had two major earthquakes, and Kumamoto Castle has been destroyed, which is a real uh, terrible disaster in, in itself. And we've run projects for Nepal as, as well. So as we came into, into this, this moment's event, as COVID started going off, we wondered what Pachacha could do. Uh, so we started making small presentations like this fantastic one by Brian here about how, how to wash your hands and it shows the history of soap and things like that. Um, but then we thought, how could we actually get, get in deeper? And so we've been running these. We ran an event last week in the UK and getting people, creative people, people who are making a difference uh, at, at the moment through creativity to present their work and hopefully inspire other people to do the same or to do more. So, um, yeah, it's uh, so this is our second event and uh, we're really excited about that and excited to hear what everybody's got to say. So last week's event was in the UK and it was run by Kylie, uh, sorry, by, by Brogan and Kyle uh, of Pachacha London and Pachacha Manchester. And it was called United for the United Kingdom. And here it is on someone's TV streaming out on U U YouTube. They timed the beer break perfectly for eight o'clock. So we all clapped for the National Health Service for the frontline workers there. The great thing is on our Pachacha website, we've been developing, before COVID even started, we've been developing this uh, new platform called Pachacha Create. And many of the presentations tonight have been submitted through this uh, format, where you're online through your browser on a, a computer, laptop, or, or, or smartphone, you can upload 20 images, voice them, and share them. And uh, so we encourage people to make presentations on Pachacha Create. It's free, it's great for schools, and just go across to our website and hit the Create tab. So... Thank you all very, very much. And um, we hope you help inspire the world either by watching the, uh, the presenters tonight or by making uh, presentations on our Create uh, pl platform. Thank you all very much. <laughs> Great job, Mark. <laughs> oh, that is that's, fantastic. That's always tough, yeah. <laughs> Well, we had a, there was a slightly pressure moment before we started with the, with the we had a, we had a cloud issue go down but anyway we've we're through it now so thank you all very much very good <laughs> and um you know if you don't like the format you could always take it up with the guy who invented it <laughs> <laughs> what very what good. What dawns on me every time is not just the moment of sharing a Pecha Kucha and what this is doing with Inspire the World, 
but the archiving, I mean, this is documentation for generations to come on what yeah. um, stories need to be told. So that was just awesome. Just really kudos. Okay, so presenter number one is uh, safely underway. And so that leads us to <laughs> presenter number two, Carl Bass. Carl, go ahead and get your lungs ready here. Carl <laughs> is a self unemployed designer and inventor building electric vehicles, robots, furniture, sculpture, and now personal protective equipment in, Berkeley, in his Berkeley workshop. Carl was the CEO of Autodesk, Buzzsaw, and Ithaca Software. When not building stuff, he is the advisor and advisor to many companies, including Google, Zendesk, Aris Composites, Built Robotics, Dendrite, and Topology, Planet, and Zooks, if I pronounce that one right. He will talk about how he and his team are making a difference in this very moment. So, Carl, Lana, are you ready? Lana, Lana, I should just say that Carl is one of the biggest and longest Pachacha supporters when he was at Autodesk. Uh, they were great That's supporters right. of Pachacha, and he used it within Autodesk. And Carl's been just a fantastic friend uh, for uh, many, many years. I just want to say thank you, Carl, for taking time out of your super busy schedule to make the presentation and be online tonight. Thank you so much. No problem, Mark. My pleasure. Awesome. So Carl, whenever you're ready, let Brian know. Let's go. So I became self-unemployed about three years ago after having spent most of my career at Autodesk and my bucket list was huge. So I got back in the shop and I started making things. I was working on taking a 1950 Chevy pickup truck and making it an electric vehicle. And then I built this canoe with my son and some friends. And now I had time to go even go canoeing. I continue to work on generative design, you know, using a computer to help design, not just document stuff. And here's a, here's a chair we did where we took a MIG welder and turned it into a metal 3D printer. You know, and in addition, my family really wanted um, to go to safari, you know, to go to Africa on safari. And this was not on my bucket list. In fact, it was on my fuck it list. You know, but I, I was wrong. It turned out to be an awesome trip. And it made me realize just how fragile life is and how amazing it is that us humans made it out of Africa, given that we're not the strongest or the fastest. It was just creativity. And that thought was a perfect backdrop for the current crisis. You know, but instead of a huge carnivore, we're fighting the enemy this time is a microscopic virus. We all read about it and then started saying to ourselves, this is really going to be a big global deal. And we all said to ourselves, what are we going to do about it? Now, a few people reached out to me to see if we could help with open source ventilators. Everyone thought ventilators were going to be the equipment that we most needed. But people started to warn us that the PPE problem was really serious. And if there wasn't PPE, no nurses or doctors were going to be around to put us on ventilators. Um, and then we started reading reports in the newspapers and hearing from local doctors and nurses how bad the situation was, wearing garbage bags to do intubations. And so the first thing everyone thought about was N95 masks. But without face shields, N95 masks were getting soiled easily and had to be changed all the time. So the design challenge became, how can we make lots of face shields really quickly and cheaply enough so that we could donate them to everyone who needed them? You know, basically use whatever's available and in a ridiculously short time frame, turned it into something useful. And so that's what we did for PPE, built from whatever we had at hand. We thought about 3D printing them, but decided we couldn't make them fast enough. But my friend, Chris Taggart had this great idea. We could buy hats wholesale for like a buck and a half each. So what if we could take a piece of plastic and attach it to the hat? So we tried some fasteners, but we eventually landed on just snipping the brim and cutting the plastic and then just snapping it into, then snapping it into place. Um, so we went to work using the tools we had. Uh, we got some friends to start cutting and folding them. And for all of us, all of us who build prototypes and one-offs, this was a huge shift in our mentality. How are we gonna make hundreds of these face shields? So we got more friends and families involved. They, they assembled the first few hundred face shields and we worked out the kinks and the designs and we built some tools and we built some templates. And uh, the one thing I must say, it's been a real pleasure working with fan, you know, friends and family through this most difficult crisis and all trying to lend a hand. 
We also work with some nurses in the local hospitals who are desperately in need of PPE. And they delivered them into the emergency rooms and the ICUs of the local hospitals. They had just staged a walkout because they were being forced into what they considered unsafe conditions. One nurse told us if three months ago we had used PPA, the PPE the way we're using it now, we would have been fired. And as we got them in the hands of the people, we got all kinds of encouragement. And after all, this was an unconventional design. And we had no idea what the reaction would be. Um, what became clear is it wasn't just nurses and doctors, it was everyone on the front lines who really needed the protection. You know, and the need was acute and it was seemingly endless. So the question became, how are we gonna make thousands? So we published an instructable. Our friend Hans made an animation, Chris made a video showing how to cut and assemble the shields. Um, and we put together a GoFundMe that's raised over $50,000. So thanks to everybody who's contributed. Uh, we really appreciate it. Our friend Emily Pilladin and the girls at Girls Garage jumped in to help. And we had people from all over, friends, neighbors, strangers, volunteer to help. Several companies like Silent Nanotech and um, our friends at Bill Chrysler, they all jumped in with dozens of people to help cut and fold and assemble them. Um, Sports teams like the Red Sox and the Giants and the Warriors all donated hats. Companies like Zendesk gave us boxes of hats. And the shop just became this steady stream of stuff coming in and stuff going out. And we were now able to make and deliver more than a thousand. The enthusiasm of the volunteers was great, but the roadblock were the hospital administrators. They wanted us to fill out reams of paperwork about our F FDA and NIO certifications. And they often did it, you know, so the nurses were the ones who got it in there. And they often did it in the face of threats, you know, of real retribution from hospital administration. And then the folks on the front line said, how about a positive air pressure respirator? The shields are so good. So the design challenge started again. You know, could we make a papper from stuff we could buy at Home Depot? Uh, our friend Philip, who's been an engineer on Indy race cars, he jumped in. So we, talk, we took a store-bought fan, a vacuum, a vacuum cleaner filter, and a battery, and we're just starting to make positive air pressure respirators and thinking about how to scale production and hoping the old supply chains kick in. It's absolutely crazy what we're all doing. It's been a colossal systemic failure. And I walked into the bathroom this morning at the shop, and I thought this picture just summed it all up perfectly. You know, the shit has hit the fan, and we're all running out of toilet paper. But it's important to remember why we're doing this. It's the nurses and doctors and all the other people on the front lines who have really and truly been the heroes of this tragedy. They've risked their lives, they've risked the lives of their families to help all of us. And we all, we owe them a tremendous amount of gratitude. Thanks. It's so fantastic. I love um, that you're sharing and, and giving honor to the nurses, but you know, you wouldn't, you don't have to be doing this. It's amazing that you're doing this. That is just so awesome. And I'm glad that everyone gets to hear about all this. It's the beauty of PK. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so I'm moving on to presenter three. And I had to Google and do a bunch of video watching to find out how to pronounce his name. This is Eve Behar. Did I get that right? Good job. Okay. <laughs> I'm Eve. just gonna mute everybody. Can you just hold on one second? Yeah, continue. Sorry, I'm just, just give me one second. Uh, Lana, uh, unmute. Lana, we just had a few issues here. Just one second, uh, Mark Dytham, and I've got to unmute. Eve. Okay. Eve, I'm not sure which one am I muting here. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. All right, good. Great. Sorry about that. We've, we've, got a, we've got a little issue that Brian can't see all the screens to mute and unmute at the moment. We're just trying to work that out. So it'll be a little bit difficult between presenters because I'm doing that uh, over on this side of the office. <laughs> we're, we're separate because we, we'd have to wear masks otherwise. So, um, and you wouldn't be able to hear us talk very well. So 
I think we're good to go. Okay. Brian, are you okay? So, yeah. Are you, yeah. Okay. Hey, let me know when to start. Well, first, we have to tell everyone who you are. So, <laughs> if you'll indulge me, Eve has pioneered design as a force of positive social and environmental change. His humanitarian work includes One Laptop Per Child and See Better to Learn Better, which has distributed 6 million free corrective eyeglasses to school children in Mexico over the last 10 years. He has uh, received the Index Award for these projects, making him the only designer to receive this award twice. Eve has also been at the forefront of entrepreneurial venture design, co-founding Form Life, August, and Canopy, as well as partnering with numerous startups such as Happiest Baby Snoo, Uber, Cobalt, Desktop Metal, Sweet Green, and many others. Additional collaborations with partners like Herman Miller, a Michigan company, Movado, Samsung, Puma, EC Mayaki, is that pronounced right? Prada, SodaStream, Nivea, and many others. So quite the resume there, Eve. Whenever you are ready, uh, give Brian the go ahead. Great, let's do it. <clears throat> okay, hi everyone. Um, COVID-19 has been crazy, disorienting, and certainly tragic. Um, but also there's been some personal realizations. And uh, what I ask myself is if this hadn't happened, um, what would I never have been able to do? Um, and I'll tell you some of those things. It's both personal, um, but also uh, professional. So first I would never have been able to have every meal, breakfast, lunch, dinner with the people I love most, you know, the family. And also I would have, I'm rediscovering old games I used to play as a child. So like pickup sticks, for example, it gets really competitive. Um, the other thing I would never have been able to do is catch up with American teen movie classics, uh, like the back, uh, back of the future, back to the future tr trilogy. Um, and it's a really big gap in my uh, cultural knowledge. Um, the most amazing thing about it is that, um, you know, forget the time machine. What I want is the overboard. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I would, um, uh, that, that's been extraordinary is I stayed off airplanes. Uh, in my wildest dreams, could I have ever imagined not being in an airplane and not flying? And it feels great. Um, and of course, being in touch with my team at Fuse Project, which are from all around the world, and some of them are around the world, um, has been amazing. Um, and then I've never realized before how seeing people via Zoom has been so sort of human. Um, and I've seen people's homes, their partners, their kids, their pets. Um, and we're a lot more tolerant about life's interruptions. Um, less formality means uh, more humanity. I've also been able to do a lot of home projects, as you can see here, and building a surf, a surf shack for my surfboards and some other things really sort of makes me a local finally after 20 plus years, 25 years in California. Um, and wow, suddenly I have a lot of time. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that happened is I would never have been able to play doctor. Um, I actually had to do it in a real situation uh, with hospitals and doctors uh, needing us to stay away. I borrowed old tools from a neighbor and uh, cast a, cut the cast off my oldest boy. Um, it was actually really hard to do, uh, but the patient survived um, that procedure. Um, the other thing that I love is fast projects and in time of crisis, the team at Fuse Project, uh, we would not have been able to do a new identity for a testing company. Um, it's really about uh, love and uh, taking care of others. Um, we also got involved in the free testing for the entire Bolinas community, um, which is being done in collaboration with UCSF and will start tomorrow. Um, we did the, the website um, for what will be a PCR test as well as an antibody test. So lots of involvement locally. If this crisis would not have, would not have happened, I would have missed the supermoon. I also learned how to um, shoot uh, from my iPhone with a bin you know through a binocular. Um, but there's many lessons that to take us back to take back to the normal world. And one is of moderation and considered consumption. Talking about animals and nature, um, 
we, the brand team at Fuse Project has created this uh, informational campaign. And this one is using animals to illustrate um, the simple ways uh, that we can make a difference. And you know, the charm of, of the animals and their behavior is something that uh, you know, we think will help us make the right decisions. Um, we also um, are uh, formatting them in many different ways. So they're usable anywhere. We're making it available and we're also providing translation for different countries um, that want to uh, use that campaign. I would never have been able to understand how memes are everywhere. My 80-year-old parents are sending me memes constantly. Everything from uh, giant, giant paper rolls uh, to the, the guy uh, with option A and B, which you've got to watch it, um, to extreme skiing in your bedroom. Um, the other thing that uh, happened is I would never have imagined hearing journalists tell me that we timed the form launch uh, perfectly, which obviously we didn't time it. Um, this is a company that has been in development for four years. Um, and we went ahead and made the announcement. It's about well-being, body and mind in the home. And, um, you know, for me going to the gym is extra time that I don't have. And so being able to be, do resistance training or yoga or meditation is important, but also it needs to disappear. I don't have enough room for a home gym. Uh, very few people do. So, we're all trying to figure out today how to work out at home, uh, how to stay in shape. Um, I also um, have been able to uh, work with my prefab building partner, Plant Prefab, on low-cost housing. In the past, uh, we worked on um, um, ADUs, accessory dwelling units, um, and these are a number of experiments. This is one of them. It's a concept um, around uh, low-cost housing. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I have to really talk about it is uh, stay at home means homeschooling and loads of it. And it's crazy busy for parents to juggle uh, work and kids. Um, and it's exactly like pushing four kids on a swing set all at the same time while they're screaming, push me, push me all at once. I wish you could see the video there. Um, <clears throat> but it definitely made me realize how teachers and um, and uh, medical staff are heroes. And this is also another campaign that we have done, which is about celebrating the people we rely to in case of crisis, like, um, uh, like medical staff and, and, uh, and teachers. And then finally, one little bit of advice is next time we go into work from home, you should try to quarantine with friends. Uh, we took two friends in, one from New York and one from France, and I actually collaborated with Marcos um, of Mafia Bags uh, before. So we are uh, working on uh, designing ways that normal life will have to integrate um, the use of masks that need to be both protective, but also personal and fashionable. So my question to you is one, what are the things you would have never been able to do? Um, and two, what will you take back to normal life? Um, and for me, I'll say I definitely want more virtual conferences. Thank you. <laughs> that was so cool. Eve. To get to know you on a personal level is very cool. Um, and then we, we know that testing is key to overcoming um, COVID-19. So like efforts in the right spot on that. And then of course I get a bunch of text in between saying, how can you not pronounce his name right <laughs> from my <laughs> designer friends? No, you did. You did one, uh, one time recently, I was, um, I was called on stage by the name of Wives Bihar. So uh, you did really well. <laughs> <laughs> See, Chris? <No. laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Eve. Yeah, thank uh, you so much, Eve. That was awesome. Um, really amazing. And, and again, I think for all of us too, not having to travel has been a real revelation. Certainly not having compounded jet lag like we normally do here in Tokyo. Every time you get on a flight, it's eight or nine hours somewhere. So not, not to have that, not that waste of time. And also just to spend more time uh, in the office, not having to go for meetings. It's been really, really amazing. And I think we've got a lot more done. So um, very interesting times. Thank you so right. much. Thank you. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, the next presenter, Matt Byspiel. I have that pronounced right. Uh, Matt has been stewarding brands and fully integrating campaigns for three decades. 
He looked after the global brand strategy and development for McDonald's and stewarded the global I'm Loving It campaign across 120 countries. His leadership resulted in a decade of growth, becoming the FE's world's most effective advertising brand for two consecutive years and the Cannes Lions Marketer of the Year, where he is credited for 88 Cannes Lions. He famous, I'm sorry, famous, famously said that brands excel in the environment of fun and die in the environment of fear. So where do they go now? He will answer that. Whenever you are ready, Matt, you just give Brian. Right. Um, so Brian, are you ready to go? If, yes, you are. So oh, yes. Uh, the first slide, please. In uh, 1967, uh, the band Buffalo Springfield wrote the lyric, there's something happening here. What it is ain't exactly clear. There's a man with a gun over there telling me I've got to beware. I think it's time to stop, children. What's that sound? Everybody look what's going down. And what's going down today is a pandemic that we've never seen before. And as a marketing guy, I thought I'd take a different look at it and look at it from an existential perspective. And if you look at it from that standpoint, COVID-19 is really part of a series of global events that are a signal from the universe that we need to stop um, and we need to pause and look at our lives. This has been leading up. There's been major events, obviously, throughout the decades. This is just a couple. So solar eclipse of the sun and the energy that that created, the energy from Steve Jobs and creating the iPad energy from hot songs like the Harlem Shake and of course the Me Too movement. You know, some more serious things are part of this movement as well. This massive humanity that's um, been migrating from different parts of the world. This is an image from Latin America. You know, the first shot ever of a black hole and what that might mean for humanity. And of course, these awful shootings that have happened around the world, largely in the US. Um, and then these once in a lifetime events, you know, the Amazon forest burning, Australia burning, California burning. Last year um, in North America, we had the solar uh, vortex, the polar vortex. And, and so all of these events are happening and culminating here, COVID-19. And, and my thought was maybe, maybe the age of urgency isn't so urgent after all. And maybe we should be looking at our lives just a little bit differently. Um, Yes, this, this virus has been awful. Last count, uh, 2 million people with the virus, 133,000 people have perished. Um, but you could look at it, the downside, but you could also say this is a gift. It's a, it's a gift of time, as Eve was talking, a gift to reconnect with what's really, really important. Um, this is from uh, Kung Fu Panda, uh, for those of you who had kids from 2008. Um, you know, the world stopped. And we talked about not being on airplanes, but the world has come to a crashing halt. The LA freeway in the middle, you know, the towers in, in Kuala Lumpur, the beaches of Rio, everything is empty. Everyone is hunkering down. We've all used the word hunker more than ever in our lives. And they'd like daily things. You know, my kids, I have a 15 and 16 year old, school's closed, playgrounds are closed. No one's flying, airports are completely empty and houses of worship you know, are rethinking how people are praying and the kind of distances they need to keep. You know, at the same time, uh, it's bringing us together in really interesting ways. You know, over on the left, who would have thought that in McDonald's you'd be standing in a, in a square or you'd be walking down the street and see signs about washing your hands. My mother's 84 years old and she's using Zoom for her New Yorker meetings. What does the new world look like? This is an image um, from Wuhan, of workers getting ready to go to work. What's it going to be like in your part of the world? Will you get in an elevator with other people? Will you sit at a restaurant? And what does this mean for humans? And I'd like to look at a little bit of what does it mean for brands? You know, for people, you know, this pause is a chance for us to really be grateful for the things that we have in our lives. It's a chance for us to think about who I'm we really scared. are. You know, who, who we are and what we're all about. And of course, relationships and how to reconnect with those. I'm sorry, Mark. Brands started um, by looking at how they could help. And I've been in this situation where you look at these crises and say, how do we help? 
In this case is about using their brand identities for social distancing. But certainly there's more that brands could do and should be doing you know, as we move forward. I think the first thing that's kind of gotten out of whack over the years is the, the balance between um, brands driving sales overnight versus building equity over time. And building equity over time is about creating an emotional connection to differentiate your brand from all others on intangible levels. And to do that, real strategic rigor is needed. I like simple things. This is a simple way to think about strategic briefs. What do you want people to think, feel, and do? What do you want your customers to think, your employees to think, your stakeholders, investors, Think, feel, do is a nice way to put that kind of into context. Brands, this is not a way, this is not a time to advertise our way out of this, this crisis. We need to think about brand behaviors, thinking about your brand as being useful. Look at an example like HP donating 3D printers. We heard from Carl and the work that he's doing. Brands need to be taking action and they need to be true to who they are. If you were into the CSR game before COVID-19, double click on it. If you weren't, don't go there. People can smell a fake from a thousand miles away. Be true to who you are and be authentic. I've always felt that, um, that data makes you right, but creativity makes you special. And today when all products are good, When's the last time you bought a bad product? It doesn't happen anymore. So creativity makes brands special that drives commerce. Um, I saw a data point from some new research that happened uh, a month ago. It said that 71% of people say that they think brands, if brands are putting profit before people, that they will lose their trust forever. As we get back into the business, trust truly is a must. And finally, there's no playbook, right? No one's written a playbook for a global pandemic. So as you're thinking about your businesses, I would encourage you to collaborate and align and share. This is a quote from Ray Kroc who founded McDonald's. He said that none of us is as good as all of us. And I think that thought will serve us well in the post COVID days. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, that is major food for thought, Matt. Um, I'm gonna mute. Sorry. I'm going to mute everybody just a second. Continue. Okay. And let's go back and unmute you. Okay. And Hi, Lana. We're back. Uh, all unmuted. Um, if anybody, well, by the way, I'm, we're just getting lots of tips coming in how to use Zoom. If anybody wants to speak, all they have to do is press the space bar and it allows you space bar on your laptop. And I'm getting a little bit of feedback from probably from Astrid. I just turn her off here. Um, you just press the sub space bar and um, yeah, Astrid. So I'm just mute Astrid. If you press the space bar, it opens up your mic. So um, <laughs> no, I just shut it down. So yeah, <laughs> so that's, that's a nice little feature there. If you want to jump in with a comment, press your space bar. Okay, no, a great presentation, Matt. And I think, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an incredible thing for advertising agencies and brands. What, you know, this, this is just an instant, an instant change of, of such massive proportions that it, you know, it, it's just, uh, you know, there, as you say, there is no playbook. Um, and how brands respond to this, I think, is really going to show how good the brand is or how good the advertising agency is anyway. <laughs> but I yeah. just I just want to jump in here and uh, and say it's like the it, it, I mean, we, we, we knew a long time ago that creativity uh, is uh, is what brings uh, uh, evolution forward. Um, it's um, it's it's the one it's the one thing. Uh, that that kind of uh, it, it, that's the engine of evolution, really. And uh, but also, if you stay authentic, uh, and I think that's also what uh, what made Pachakcha kind of still relevant, uh, uh, because it's people telling their own stories. It's people uh, uh, telling you know the the just simple stories uh, which are authentic and unique. 
and that's why a kind of pachacha still is going strong and hopefully uh, will tell many more creative stories. So true. Okay. okay. Any other comments before we go ahead and move on? Okay. Chantal Martin. Oh, go ahead. Just, just yeah, just press your space bar if you want to chat. So, okay, Chantel. <laughs> okay, it's Chantel Martin is on deck. Chantel, who has come a long way, I'm getting this from inside sources, from uh, her days drawing in Tokyo at Bijang at Super Deluxe, the birthplace of Pecha Pucha, uh, is a visual artist best known for her large scale black and white drawings and collaborations with artists and institutions like Kendrick L Lamar, what? The New York City Ballet, mm -hmm. Tiffany and Company, Puma, the Albright Knox Art Gallery, the Museum of the Moving Image and the Museum of Modern Art and more. Upcoming ex exhibit new slash now opens in New Britain Museum of Art, which is in Connecticut, I believe, later this year, knock on wood, everything's opening. Um, so Chantal, whenever you're ready. Cool, I'm ready. Come home, go home. We are all home right now. Come home, I feel like I'm coming home in a way because my first Pachacha was in 2007, which feels like a lifetime ago. And um, this is a piece that I did with my grandmother and collaboration with family has always been a huge thing that I bring a strong believer in. We've got some pictures here of uh, Super Deluxe and other venues in Tokyo. And I never imagined the world that I would live in today. And I never imagined the things that you could create with a pen. You know, drawing in the clubs in Japan, I drew a path for myself that no one ever imagined for me. And that path took me to New York. And, and this is a picture of my bedroom when I first moved to New York. And, it was a safe place, you know, I could wake up and it was one of the first places that was really my own. And I felt safe there and so much that I drew all over the walls and the ceilings and everywhere else. And so drawing in a way has been something that has saved me. It has given me a platform, it's allowed me to travel, it's allowed me to meet so many incredible people from around the world. But more importantly, it's allowed me to ask questions and it's allowed me to ask these questions and plant seeds. And it's allowed me to ask questions like this, you know, who are you? It's a big kind of existential question that we're all kind of scared of. But if you take a few of these letters away and just look at the W-A-Y, it's more about how are we finding our way in life? I'm finding my way in life through a language of words and lines and drawing. I'm finding my way in life through asking simple questions like, who are you? Are you you? You are you. We are we. And these questions are important to be asked because if we don't understand who we are at the core as people, then nothing else really matters. You know, we can talk about where we're from. We can talk about the jobs that we do. We can talk about the roles that we play in life. But how do we actually answer the question of who we are at the core? And when we start to figure out these questions, we will start to fix the problems in the world. And I love drawing because it's a way of imagining worlds and immersing people in your worlds. And, and I love creating work that is bigger than me physically, because when I draw bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, it shows me that we can be more confident than ourselves. It shows me that we can create with something so simple as a pen, but give it such life that it is bigger and bolder and much larger than anything we can imagine. And I've really enjoyed over the last few years working with different charities, working with different organizations, doing residencies at places like Autodesk where I get to create building blocks that allow me to draw with multiple tools instead of one tool. I've really enjoyed being at places like MIT, at the Media Lab, where I get to really explore this juxtaposition between creativity and efficiency. And, and here's a circuit board that I designed that, that 
some of the functions of the of the lines tell what the actual sensor does. So this is an air quality sensor that tests for the toxicity in the air. And so, you know, I really love this idea about merging technology and creativity. I've also really enjoyed collaborating with different brands and institution and then shooting them in places like where I grew up. So this is a line that I did with Puma and we actually shot it in Thamesmead in Southeast London and that's where I grew up. One of these big council estates that no one really wants to live there, but people like myself grow up there. And so we can pay homage to it. And collaborating is a big thing, you know, collaborating with, like I said, brands, institutions, models, rappers, because that's when you really get to bring your voice and someone else's voice and create something really new and fresh. And we talked a little bit earlier, people were talking about this idea of authenticity and where that comes from. And for me, it comes from this idea of just surviving. You know, why do you draw? Why do you design? Why do you think the way that you think? And it is because we're all culminations of where we're from and working really hard at doing those things. And I loved that I collaborated with the New York City Ballet last year. And that was really amazing because you get to see, you know, dancers work seven, eight days a week, even if there isn't eight days in a the week, they're working it. And I love working with people that have such discipline, but also have such focus in what they're doing. For a long time, I wanted to create a space for freedom, for poetry, for contemplation. And that thought found a home in this building here. This is on Governor's Island and it's in a decommissioned church. And I created a space called the May Room. And so you walk into the May Room and you take your shoes off and you walk this path in the form of a drawing. And that path says, may you find self. And then on the back wall of this church, this decommissioned church, there's lots of words, may you find self, may you sleep soundly at night, may we save trees, may you, may we. And so that message is coming there. And so everything you know, goes full cycle. And tomorrow, actually, I launch my first art book. And that's kind of incredible because I get to look back and have that power of reflection over a career and over this whole journey and pick it up in a book and look at it and imagine where it can go next. Where am I going to go next? Where are you going to go next? And really just, it's so nice to have this physical thing that, allows you to look at your life and look at the path and start to really think about where you're going to go tomorrow and where we're going to go next year. I have no idea where I'm going to go, but I'm very much looking forward to it. And I hope that you are all too. Thank you very much. I'm Chantal Martin and I love drawing. <laughs> Chantal, this was really lovely. Uh, again, um, it, it appeals to emotion and the, the poetry of it and uh, who, who are you is, is really, uh, you, you phrased it so well. It's like, if you don't know who we are, you know, what's the point of everything else? Um, so yeah, uh, I kind of uh, look forward where you're going to be next. Um, thank you so much. Cool, thank you. I saw, I saw some little people appear. Hi. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hi. Hi. Why don't you introduce your kids? They look lovely there. You <laughs> have, say the hi um, to them anyway. You have many fans, uh, Chantal, <laughs> and uh, uh, the five-year-old and the nine-year-old, Silver oh. and Soleil, Soleil and Silver, um, wanted to uh, are very familiar with your work. Studying and uh, they studied in school, and they can't believe. We're in the same conference together. Oh, nice. <laughs> well, um, I'll DM you or something, and I'll send you all a coloring in book. Oh. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> That's amazing. Your book launch launches oh. tomorrow. That's so fantastic. Yeah. We didn't plan yeah. this at all. So. Yeah. And per thank you for finding timing. time. Thank you for finding time as well. I know it's super late with you in New York. It's been difficult to spread this across around the world. But it, it, it's so lovely that you started or you, or, you know, you worked with us and we, we did things with you in Super Deluxe and then you presented at Pachacha way back when. Uh, and we've been following your career and everything you're doing up to the recent stuff in Times Square where you put your, your graphics all across or your words all across Times Square. It's absolutely amazing. And your presentation really resounded tonight because I think we're all questioning at the moment who we are. I think the world is questioning it, that that too. So 
perfect presentation. Thank you so, so much. Well, well thanks for having me. And, and, you know, I'm in great company. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. OK, we're going to take uh, a quick five minute break if anybody uh, wants to um, take a take take a break. Um, normally it's it's a beer break. Um, I don't have any uh, beer cans uh, around <laughs> at the time. Um, and uh, we were just going to have a Brian. Brian, are you there, man? Yes, oh, you've been doing a, yeah. You're doing a sterling job around there. Uh, it's, Everybody, it's, um, I, let me let me just say real quickly at this time. Uh, I th I really loved what Eve said about um, about how this is really one a thought that we had that is unique to this online experience as opposed to the, a physical event where we get to present uh, our, our our works. We get to we get to see into the places where people create. And um, it, there is something, uh, there's some ir irony in that though we are further apart than ever right now, somehow we're also very uh, close at the same time. And I think the, the hiccups that we've had uh, uh, along the way, which I want to just take this chance to apologize for a little bit, is a reflection of this authenticity that keeps um, appearing. So I want to thank everybody for their patience few unexpected things but I'll, um, I'm excited to uh, continue doing these and room for improvement so look look out for some improvements in the second set right why don't you mute, why don't you mute there Brian then we not we won't echo too much around yeah so I've just I've just undone my uh I've just undone my background so you can see where uh so where we, we are so uh that's a little a little view into our, our office. Astrid is over in the back there somewhere. We've got the plant man in, in fact, at the moment, um, <laughs> to do it doing our plants, which is kind of funny. Um, but it is it has been interesting that we can connect people. We, we'd always been nervous about running uh, protraction nights live and streaming them because we thought it would take away from the actual live event. People wouldn't go out; they'd stay at home and just watch. Oh, I can't. You know, it's raining. I can't be bothered to go to to, to Super Deluxe or or, or wherever. Um, but now, of course, we're kind of forced to do something. And it's been very interesting, uh, as Brian says, to bring everybody together. And it's amazing that we can talk with all these people around the world. Um, and just like um, just like Eve's um, his, his, uh, gym, you know, that had been in development for a long time a lot more uh, uh, you know since uh, you know a year ago I guess and had no, no idea that uh, it, it would arrive during this pan pandemic and the same for project to create to our online auth authoring tool you know we, that's been in the works for a, a year or so and now it's become extremely relevant I think that people can make presentations and submit them and share them on online without actually going to a, to a live project event so uh, yeah it's really amazing and Carl you're doing great stuff man I mean um, Carl was one of the reasons that I think Brian's on uh, I'm getting a bit of feedback there it's Astrid yes because I was gonna say uh, uh, Carl's presentation was like the 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 typical uh, uh, behavior of you know you give a little you give a little and it comes back thousandfold uh, and uh, we don't realize often that you know, all you have to do is just give a little. I think uh, Chantel touched a little bit on that. Just do something bigger than you, and uh, and you know, and it gives you confidence, and it comes back so so many fold. And uh, I think uh, more people need to realize that and just take that little step to give a little, and uh, not worry about it. Just do it. You know, it's kind of a um so, yeah it's a bit of a cliche phrase now but anyway it's so true just do it and see what happens so true. great yeah Brian, I, could, I could understand that too wait mark you're muted Okay, sorry, I'm muting myself there. <laughs> okay, um, it, yes, I think we're going to get 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 starting again. Um, if everybody's uh, if everybody's ready, and thank you for staying on on the on the call. We weren't we thought people would dro drop in and drop out, but uh, um, it's fantastic. You're all you're all still still there. So we have five um, five more amazing uh, presenters, and uh, are you you good there, Brian? I'm. Uh, he's getting there. Okay. <laughs> We've realized that Brian has got two screens. He actually needs three screens to make to operate this. So uh, that's uh, that's a thing that we've learned uh, learned 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 today. So um, okay, over to you, Lana. Have I got to unmute you? 
or are you I'm, muted? I'm good. Yeah. All right. Over to you. All right. Um, take some stretch liberties here. Okay. So Cameron Sinclair. Uh, Cameron is the very first winner of the TED Prize, which is super cool. Uh, uh, Cameron will be talking about his work with Juke, a flat pack startup that has developed uh, the world's first standalone intensive care unit and other COVID responsive uh, projects. So Cameron, over to you. Okay. Yeah. How much? You guys can see, hear me all right? We can. Yep, Let perfect. Brian know whenever you're ready. Brian, I'm... Um, Ready and waiting to go. Okay, hi everybody. I'm Cameron Sinclair, um, long time PK. I just realized I was in Haiti and Japan through both uh, disasters doing presentations and here I am in New York City. Um, I co-run uh, World Changing, which is an off-grid um, low carbon housing company, but I'm gonna talk about how we can do it. Now, um, <laughs> I've worked on design solutions in areas of crisis for more than 20 years climate related disasters come and go, and there are many more on the way. But today we're facing a new challenge, an invisible crisis that has come to all of us. Coronavirus has invaded our places of work, our places of learning, our places of worship, and the places we call home. Now, we've seen hospitals in Europe and the United States are overwhelmed. And based on the studies in Harvard and Imperial, that our hospitals need a thousand percent their current ICU beds just to deal with the curve that we're about to face. So we need to mobilize rest and recovery spaces where it's needed most. So we decided, let's look for the crazy ones. We formed a team of frontline doctors, ER nurses, rocket engineers, modular housing experts, 3D printers, uh, electric vehicle manufacturing gurus, former fighter pilots, and a guy who actually lived in a tricked out dumpster for a year. We did it in a weekend. And we put together teams on build, heal, and respond. We began working with um, hospitals and clinics all across the country. I'm here in New York City. We began to fit, realize there was two immediate challenges, containment and capacity. Hospitals have got to keep high risk patients from the, from the settings where they could spread the virus and hospitals have to have flex options for increased care capacity. The other thing we found directly from the doctors and nurses is that limited call beds for workers and they're not going home because they don't want to get their loved ones infected. Patients are now being housed in these open warehouse style settings. This is Madrid. And there's inadequate isolation, privacy, and hygiene. This is what our doctors refer to as a virus trap. So Jupe came, became Jupe Health. It's a standalone flat pack, as was mentioned, as a rapidly deployable unit that essentially can be built um, all within the base unit of, of the home and then open up in, in a matter of minutes. We have three options. So Jupe Rest is a sleep and recovery space designed specifically for frontline healthcare professionals that are fighting uh, COVID-19. It's about 15K, depending on the features. It's about 100, 100 square feet. And it comes with all the things you can get rest and relaxation, coupled with IoT uh, uh, technologies. The care unit is actually twice the size and is an isolation and recovery unit for non-critical COVID patients. It's about 55K and it includes ventilator hookups, don and doff chambers, negative pressure uh, uh, capacity, and all the other things that you would need to, to be able to run an off-grid unit. And then the third unit is the PLUS. The PLUS is $150,000 standalone off-grid or micro-grid capable mobile ICU unit. And it's built either with a soft shell or a hard shell. Um, these are about a 30th of the cost of a traditional um, hospital treatment room. So how did this all happen? Well, actually, Jupe has been around for about a year. Uh, Jeff Wilson and Cameron Blizzard co-founded it, and they are obsessed with the skateboard chassis of the UV vehicles. And they could, you could basically put everything in, in, a, in an EV um, in the chassis. Why not do it in a home? So everything flat packs into itself. And you could rapidly deploy these, these units. 27 can go on the back of a flatbed and driven by a pickup truck to rural and urban areas across the United States. Let's go have a little time. So 
it only takes two people to drop these off. Uh, essentially, they arrive with the cover. Um, you can have one person in the front forward um, uh, handler drop them in place. And then within a couple of minutes, you can get one down. In a couple of hours, you can put a cluster together for a full team or possibly a small clinic. Then something amazing happened. So this has all happened in the last 14 days. So Amplifier, which is an arts-based nonprofit, called us and said, hey, we're doing this event to get all these artists around the world to do messages of hope and support for our frontline workers, as well as to address social distancing. Is there a way that we could put our designs and our art on your clinics? And we said, yes. So literally days ago, we set aside a way to create six custom rest units for frontline workers using the artwork. And the first collaborations that we'll be announcing are with Obey Giant, Shepard Ferry, and, and Thomas Wimberley. The design you see here uh, was done by Shep. Um, so uh, Dr. Esther Chu and myself are chief advisors for Jupe. And we were not actually focused on the immediate needs of COVID-19. It's what's happening in six weeks. Hurricane season is coming to North America and the Caribbean. And if category five storm hits anywhere, anywhere in the States, there's gonna be a disaster of untold magnitude. So we set our team aside, we got all our rocket scientists and our designers and said, can we deploy a, a post-disaster field hospital within the pandemic in less than two hours? And this is a, an example in Buffalo, New York. One of our team members is there. So we used it as an example. Um, but for me, you know, a, a massive natural disaster is gonna be tough, but there are places in the United States where there's a natural disaster happening all the time. On the tribal lands, there's barely any healthcare and um, uh, migrant farm workers, the people that bring us food, don't have proper PPE to pick that food. We need to get them care units. So we actually have put together a thing for next week called Team Storm, and you'll find out in a few days why, where you can just log on and you can actually donate and help us make as many of these as possible. We're focusing first on the rest units, and then we're gonna do the isolation and the ICU units in the next few days. So thank you so much. Uh, if you want to learn more, you can go to Jupe. If you want to support, you just go to teamstorm.org. And if you want to get a hold of me or just tweet to me, um, my stuff is here. So thank you so much, guys. Fascinating. Like utterly fascinating. That's incredible. So just, can we talk a little bit about, um, I'm going to mute everybody, hold on one sec. Yeah, hi Cameron. Can you hey, hear me, man? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so tell us a little bit about. I, I, I was interested in the fact that you were talking about rural areas too. Yeah, because cities, um, you know, are, are one thing, but I think these rural areas where suddenly these 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 pan pandemics can strike. We're seeing that in Japan as well. There are these clusters, very fast moving clusters, where they need in, in instantly. And obviously, you know, in a bigger city, you maybe have hotels which you can use. But I'm, yeah. I'm interested. You were talking about the uh, the, the real use for this. Well, as you know, like when I was when I was working on social innovation at Airbnb, I was doing rural revitalization in Japan, Jordan, and here in the U.S. And I began to see some of the things that would lead to the perfect storm, which is even here in the U.S., there are hundreds of health clinics and hospitals closing right now. This was pre-COVID, and they don't have the ability to open those up. You know, when I was in Nara. Um, you could go for ages without actually getting to see a hospital. And in the case of the uh, native lands, I, we've been talking to the Hopi and the Navajo, five tribes have got together so they could essentially rent a helicopter to take somebody to a general hospital if they are infected. That is unsustainable. And if you look at history, if you look at what happened when TB was in the United States, it wiped out tribes. And, and we just don't have the systems in place. So you know, we didn't focus on PPE. We knew there was amazing people like Carl that would do that because like mm. we have a major country, but the second wave that's going to happen is going to be where no one's looking. And just to give you a sense, there was a report that came out. I'm here in New York City. And there's a report that came out today that a lot of people have been dying in their homes because they never actually went to the hospital. So the numbers are going to be much higher. So, you know, what we're beginning to find out is who gets counted are the ones who get tested. And the more remote you go, the less testing there is. 
Right. I got a question here from from uh, Josh uh, Grogan on YouTube. He was he was wondering how, how many how many uh, how many units have you got in in the works, or how how, how many are you going to deploy? Well, this has been crazy. I mean, we 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 basically have a small warehouse in Redondo Beach and one in Monaco, Texas, <laughs> and uh, we're building them every day. Uh, we're moving into a bigger warehouse in central LA so we could do 20 at a time. But we've designed this so that we can build them with social distancing included so that nobody is within six feet of each other and we could do it with three people. So all of the mechanics and all the systems, thank God for the, the, the Tesla and the SpaceX guys who jumped ship and joined us um, because they really know how to wrap things up quickly. And our rocket engineer, Z-Dance, is just... You know, we, we give him a problem, he just goes and fixes it. So <laughs> what we want to do is we want to be able to go from um, 10 a day, I mean, uh, 10 a week to 100 a week to 1,000 a week uh, over the next six months. It probably won't happen because of funding. Um, everyone on the team is not, we're all doing this pro bono. We're all, we're, you know, we're just, just, you know, we're doing what we can. And so, you know, as we begin to get um, investment or capital, we will then... Uh, ramp up production. Yeah, that's very interesting. I think the thing that came through is that um, you can't just do this from zero. I think you've been in this game for uh, many years and, um, you know, you need your networks and your teams to kick this off qu quickly. Yeah. And it's the same for Pachacha and Inspire and to get this event on these many, many, many friends. You you were also Cameron for 10, 10, 15 years with one another. But you, you have to start uh, and you have to have, get some experience under your belt to be able to move as fast as you you have, and uh, it's pretty it's pretty and incredible what you're up to. The team has done at least a decade of this stuff, so we're kind of like grizzled veterans that just we're not we're not going to wait for FEMA, right? Yeah. Katrina, Katrina showed <laughs> don't get back for eighteen months, and 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 you know, I mean, God forbid that there's a Cat Four hurricane that hits Alabama or Mississippi because they're stay at yeah, home. Yeah, sure. Or an earthquake in Japan, touch touch wood. I mean, I think that we've got to push, we've got to forward plan these things now. I think we've, this is where the opportunity um, exists. And instead of just being reactive, we've got to be absolutely proactive. Um, and I think pe people will take us all seriously now going forward. Thank you very much, Cameron. Awesome presentation. Okay, Lana, are you unmuted? I've, I'm, <laughs> uh, I can't hear you and I've got to hear participants. Okay. Here. Yeah. I, I did it. Okay, well done. Uh, Hi, everybody. I'm so, going to chime in here real quick. Uh, yeah, our, go next, ahead. our next presenter is Dana Wang. She is the uh, 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 Temple I'm University re recent oh, a re recent graduate, and uh, she spent uh, a, a couple of months here, a semester here at our offices in PK, and um, she has kept in touch with us and she did some wonderful work while we, while she was here and we kept in great, uh, great contact with her and, uh, on her recent, uh, she's been studying in the study and working in the States and, uh, on her recent trip back to China for, uh, Chinese new year, she returned to her hometown in Wuhan and, uh, little did she know that when she got there unexpectedly, she would get stuck in her, in her uh, flat for 76 straight days. So um, we asked her to share her experience at, the, at tonight's uh, present uh, tonight's Pechikucha. And uh, because uh, all of the uh, internet service providers aren't back at work in China at the uh, not yet, service is spotty. So we've asked Dana to pre record her presentation and we're going to play it from our website. And Dana's on the call. She she said she, the internet's kind of chopping out every few minutes, but I can see you, Dana. Hi, hi Dana. And I'm just going to go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and uh, play your presentation, and then after your presentation, if we're still all connected, we'll have a little chat afterwards. So here we go. Are we ready? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Oh. One moment, please. Uh, talks amongst yourselves. Do not mind this person behind the curtain, please. Uh, oh, goodness. Okay, I think, Dana, we're going to come back to you. I think we're going to have to. Well, the beauty is we get to see the working relationship between <laughs> all of you guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, that's looking good. Are we back on track? Yeah. We are. 
Very Asby. sorry. All right. Okay, let's introduce Asby Brown. Asby will be talking about his work with SafeCast, a Japan-based crowdsourced radiation monitoring group, which formed after Fukushima nuclear, uh, the Fukushima nuclear meltdown and is proving invaluable for developing crowdsource COVID data mapping. Fantastic. Whenever you're ready. I'm ready. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hello. Yes, I'm Asby Brown. And uh, yes, I'm the lead researcher for SafeCast. But in fact, uh, I arrived in Japan about the same time as Mark and Astrid did back in the 1980s to study architecture. And uh, I'm really happy to be um, here at Pachacha and, uh, uh, you know, sharing everything and hearing these interesting talks. Yeah. So after the Fukushima disaster, there was a lot of problems with uh, information. Uh, it was kind of a clusterfuck. I mean, no one could trust the government, what they were saying. People didn't know. They wanted answers. Should they stay? Should they evacuate? You know, uh, you know what's going on? Uh, and we thought at SafeCast that we could, um, you know, maybe help people find answers and contribute to that themselves to do it through open systems. Uh, we developed a series of uh, Geiger counters, detectors that have GPS and open uh, data logging. And this was a Big ID Nano that people can buy online as a kit. There's thousands of them out there. And the, the goal was to make a trustworthy open system uh, for gathering information and uh, let everybody who wanted to participate in and contribute to. Uh, we made uh, an open database, an online mapping system, uh, which are constantly being developed now. Our map, of course, it started with Japan and Fukushima, but you know, pretty soon we had data from other countries. And now it's over 100 countries around the world, uh, 150 million data data points in the database. And again, it's open. So it's really the largest open database of its kind. Um, you know, the radiation project matured and uh, we started to look at other things we could do. And air quality monitoring was one of them. And we've been working on air quality for several years now. And this is our latest and most sophisticated air quality monitor. It's totally self-contained, solar powered. It has a, a wonderful uh, cellular modem called Note Card designed by Ray Ozzy. The whole thing is done by Ray Ozzy. It's a beautiful uh, piece of equipment. Um, but you know, the equipment and the hardware and the software and the maps are all cool. A lot of design in there, but it's about people. We're really community centered. Uh, everything we do is aimed at uh, getting answers to people who need them and helping them uh, find the answers themselves. And that is actually a big challenge, but we've become uh, pretty good at gathering, uh, you know, people together and making networks uh, that can collaborate. Um, you know, we participate in a lot of workshops and, you know, conferences with emergency responders and crisis communicators around the world. And one thing we've noticed, you know, over time is that a lot of people in other countries say, oh, that stuff that happened in, in Fukushima, you know, that was just because it's Japan. Uh, it'll never happen here. But, you know, we warned them. Uh, it can happen here. And uh, we saw what was unfolding with the response, both official and social to uh, uh, COVID-19. And we said, my God, this is deja vu. It's the same clusterfuck happening over again. Uh, and we saw this particularly in Japan with the response to the uh, Diamond Princess cruise ship. No transparency. Where is the information? How are they tracing people, et cetera? Um, I worked on the film Contagion and, uh, you know, it's really at the top of the charts now again. And I think uh, anyone who looks at it realizes that it's very accurate. There's very superb technical advisors on that. And one thing I learned was that, um, you know, you need to trace contacts. And uh, when this stuff was happening with the ship and everything, I was saying, well, who's tracing contacts? Why aren't they prioritizing that and, and focusing that on their information? Because they weren't. So we started to write about the um, comparisons between the response to Fukushima and COVID-19. Uh, and this is an article at the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, uh, because there were so many lessons that should have been learned from Fukushima and the problems with communication and official response that weren't. Um, and then as we started to our own responses, uh, we sort of first networked with other, other organizations and uh, sort of making a team of teams. And one thing we, one thing we contributed to is a online answer bot uh, done by the Federation of American Scientists. And again, our, our focus was purely, you know, how to make the information understandable. Uh, another thing was uh, the GovLab at NYU um, started an uh, instructional modules for collective crisis intelligence. In other words, people could watch these modules and then help uh, get them up and running for their own uh, responses. And we contributed two modules to that, one for uh, second and third order consequences, like what happens to society and people's stress and their mental health, et cetera. Um, so like a lot of people in Japan, you know, we're watching the response and wondering what's happening with the testing. You know, there weren't a lot of cases. Uh, and at one point, uh, Governor Koike of Tokyo put out these sort of half-hearted, you know, advisories, please, you know, 
know, social distance and close some shops. But the weekend uh, where people are supposed to be uh, sheltering, they were all out at uh, cherry blossom viewing parties. And we had a lot of alarm about that. And this issue about testing, of course, is looming very large in Japan as elsewhere. So uh, we spent uh, about a week. And in, in a week, we put up a map using the Ushahidi platform uh, for people could record their experiences seeking testing. So it's like, was, was it available? Were they trying to find testing? Was it refused? Um, do they get tested? And, and actually, when you read the comments, it's this long narrative of, of frustration and concern. We consider this an unmap. There's lots of maps of what is happening with testing, but not many much information about who is not being tested that should be. So this is crucial information that's not being recorded. And this is something we focused on and, and we're watching as this map uh, uh, matures. So the thing that we learned after Fukushima is during a crisis, people are looking for answers, but instead they often just find a lack of clarity. Uh, it was true in 2011. We're seeing this again now. And for us, you know, for SafeCast, finding and summarizing uh, important technical information is a lot of uh, what we do. And there was a big learning curve after Fukushima. There's a learning curve now, but now we are trying to help people understand the situation as well. So for instance, in Japan, uh, this issue of testing, et cetera, you know, you go to the government website and you get this graph like this. It is really ridiculously difficult to understand. It's contradicted by other sources. They're not machine readable. Uh, and this is only one example. And, and we call this ADAP, A-D-A-P, as difficult as possible. It's not the way it should be done. So of course, you know, I dove into this stuff as a researcher. That's what I do at, at SafeCast and tried to summarize the policies, tried to summarize um, the findings, et cetera, because, you know, uh, if it's hard for us to find uh, after nine years of diving into Fukushima information, uh, it's hard for everybody. And so we're doing this con con uh, consistent uh, reports online, et cetera. And as we pointed out uh, for years, everything hinges on trust. Uh, and it's especially true during crises like this when government needs to persuade people to take inconvenient and consequential protective measures that they may, may not want to do. And uh, we think, you know, trust is not a renewable resource. If, like happened in 2011 in Japan, the government and everybody loses it at the beginning, they'll never get it back. Uh, and, and it all depends on transparency. So we encourage everybody to uh, look at our site. Here's safecast.org, and we have the COVID-19 uh, site as well. Of course, this uh, presentation will be online later. You can go back, refer to it, get the URLs, uh, uh, look at what we're doing, contribute if you can, uh, and participate. We want to hear your stories, uh, what's happening to you in your area. Thank you very much. Thank you, Asti. Um, this is this is so true, uh, the, this trust issue. And I think uh, uh, with more and more social media available to everybody, uh, I think uh, the, the official sources uh, um, uh, are not being trusted, uh, uh, that they're, they're being trusted less and less, and uh, uh, people are uh, slowly but surely getting really good at doing their own uh, uh, educated uh, uh, opinion and uh, analyzing what's being said to them. And uh, I think it's it's probably, you, you know, you know the, I, I have the feeling that the people are going to decide uh, not the government. And uh, um, so, um, yeah, I think we're seeing a slow emergence of people power um, who are going to take the matters in their own hands. Yeah, we're seeing that too. There's lots of other initiatives. And again, what we what's different for us now, as opposed to nine years ago after the Fukushima disaster, is that we're teaming up as peers with others and mentoring and teaching people how to do this stuff. So it's a very different landscape. We've gotten much better at this as a society than we were 10 years ago. The tools are there. We could use the Ushahidi mapping platform, for instance. These are wonderful things. Uh, but yeah, you're right, Astrid. People vote with their feet. And in this case, they're walking inside and staying inside no matter what the government says. Although yeah. we're seeing in Japan, and it's taking a lot longer for the message to get through. And this is because of the inconsistency and lack of good communication. And we see it here. The U.S. is, I'm sorry, much worse, uh, where the, the president of the country is the largest source of misinformation about this disaster. It's everything done wrong. There will be PhDs and books written about how badly that was handled. Yeah. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm angry. I'm angry. <laughs> Uh, well, know, because it's, well, I'm just interested in this, this whole, I mean, it's been interesting in, in Japan because um, I, I, what, what's been interesting is, is the stores have shut themselves down before I, yeah. the, most of the restaurant things shut down and then people couldn't go. So then they stayed at home. So it, right. again, there was this lack of trust here. 
and a lack of why, why isn't the government doing anything? Are they gonna give it, it's gonna be a, an official lockdown or a state right. of emergency or whatever, nobody knew, but everybody began to, well, first of all, the companies shut down, the stores shut down, the restaurants shut down, and everybody stayed at home. And then the government said, oh, please stay in. So it was really, it really was yeah. led by-, by Isn't uh, that you know. interesting? You know, because here in the US, it's the reverse. We're being told to what to do and some are angry, you know, it's such a, interesting thing to learn that it was reversed, right? Yeah. But another thing here in terms of information, I just showed one sample. There's some good independent sites as well. The Japan COVID-19 map is great. Uh, it's independent. Yeah. Uh, the Tokyo, you know, perfectual, the central governments. So the true in the US is true in Japan as well. We see this in other countries as well. So it's on us. It's on our local representatives to do it. We have to tell them what we want and we can actually influence that. So like someone like Cameron, uh, you're doing this great project. I imagine that you will get your most, uh, you know, buy-in from local governments in the US. Uh, you don't, don't go to FEMA, you know, go to the governors, go to the mayors and they will be the ones who are interested. So this is a huge uh, recognition of the actual distribution of power and responsibility. And that I hope is a change that can be positive and we will live with, um, you know, going on in the future. Amazing. I'm just looking at some of the notes on YouTube here. Somebody just wrote, this is historic. So just to let you know that um, some people have, have, yeah. have enjoyed it. They're not just talking about your presentation as been right. <laughs> but it really is an amazing, it's amazing for everybody to understand what's what's yeah. going on uh, yeah. around yeah. the world. But, yeah. Keep a diary, you know, everybody. Keep a diary. Thank you so much. Over yeah. to you, Lana. Yeah. Yeah, well, if you can indulge me for a second, I was, you know, I can, this metaphor is developing about what you guys are offering, all of you presenters um, to an average American, a world average citizen of the world. It is, it's like getting into the large museum, the art museum. You have to fight your way to get some online tickets. You have to fight. And, and that's like all the news and the brochure won't cut it and the website photo. You want to get in there and you are so surprised and delighted with like, wow, what are we learning here tonight? It's amazing. And why haven't we heard this sooner? You know, it's like, it's just not available on the news, which is where we get our, or the social media for sure, right? So anyway, it's just fantastic. I'm sorry I digressed there for a second. <laughs> um, okay. Moving on here to Eddie Stellover. Actually, I'm going to chime in. We're going to try to go back to Dana. Okay. We're, we're going to try okay. one more time. We're Thanks, not, Brian. We're not try again. All right. But we'll see how it goes. You're doing a great job anyway, Brian. Um, hi, Dana. Okay. So hi. Good to see. All right. Dana, wow, your connection's still... super clear from here. Okay. Over to you, Brian. Let's see how it goes. Um, oh, please work. <laughs> please work. We're going to try, if it fails the first time, we're going to try one more time before we go on. Okay, share. Can you all see my yeah. screen? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, let's see how this goes. Hello, everyone. My yeah? name is Dana, and I Perfect. want to do a little bit self-introduction. This is me on the cover of a school brochure. I got my bachelor's degree in international business and master's degree in business analytics at Temple University, which is located in Philadelphia, United States. The summer of 2016, I studied abroad at Tokyo and I also had an internship at Petrokucha. I was sitting with Mark, uh, between Mark and Astrid in this photo. So when Mark reached out to me and said it would be fun to hear more about the Petrokucha staff's experience to be stuck in Wuhan, I decided to share this story. I was born and raised in Wuhan. When I was 19, I left Wuhan and went to US for higher education. Bye. Seven years later, in the beginning of this year, I decided to come back to China for more opportunities. Dramatically, three days after I arrived in Wuhan, the city was locked down due to the coronavirus outbreak. There are rumors that the outbreak is because people in Wuhan eat bats. No, we don't eat bats. That is never a trend in Wuhan. The most popular food in Wuhan is hot dry noodles, which is made with sesame paste. By the way, the actress for the new Mulan movie is from Wuhan. The quarantine order was very unexpectedly and there was no end date, so we didn't know how long it would continue. The first day, airports, train station, all the channels leave and enter in Wuhan was cut off. 
Then a few days later, personal vehicles were prohibited too. Next, we were not even allowed to leave the apartment building. As you can see in a photo, there were fences everywhere on streets. The quarantine orders were getting stricter and stricter. We didn't know what would be the next step, so we were confused and anxious. In order to keep residents indoor, our community uh, took orders for groceries and delivered orders to our door. Every day, the organizer would post a list of items in the residents group chat and the residents would reply with the number of each item they need. Luckily, my family and I didn't get infected. For people who are not sick, how to stay healthy, both physically and mentally, when living indoor for such a long time became the question. I got a trampoline and that's one of my best decisions. Highly recommend to everyone. My mom practiced many skills that she didn't have time or chances to use. Other than inventing new recipes, she also made pickles. Since most shops were closed and we couldn't leave the building unless it's emergency, she also became my dad's personal hairdresser. Health QR code system was invented during this time. If you reported being housed continuously and your location has no new patients for a few days, you will get a green code. People can check the number of COVID-19 cases in China on their cell phones. And close to the end of quarantine, even though all public transportations were still down, people were allowed to go out if you wear a face mask, has a normal body temperature, and has a green health code. There are securities to scan our health code in all public facilities. So finally, we were able to go out and life is getting back to normal step by step while anti-epidemic measures are still on. Restaurants are for takeout only, but at least people can go out and enjoy more of life now. I was living abroad for seven years and I missed a lot of family time. Being an international student in US means that I couldn't spend Chinese New Year with my family because it's always school time. This quarantine gave me an opportunity to reconnect with my parents. When I saw so many people lost their loved ones in this global challenge, I feel really thankful that I still have the chance to see my parents and to be with them. The pandemic and the quarantine forced us to slow down and reflect a lot of things in our life. Wuhan was locked down for 76 days. Surprisingly, life was pretty in order here. There was not much chaos of fighting over supplies. Nobody ever thought a big city with 11 million population can complete such a task. Wuhan showed the world that an uh, infect way to uh, control epidemic and pandemic. There are a few things I have learned during this uh, special experience. First, we are really living in a global village. In the old days, if an epidemic happened in one area, it wouldn't be spread out too far. However, in the modern days, before people even realized there is an epidemic, there would be hundreds, even thousands of people already left there by airplane and spread the virus to other countries in just a few days. When we face pandemic, environment problems, and more issues, every country has to join hands. That is not an ocean. That is the only way. The second thing I've learned is every ordinary day is a good day that we should cherish. People tend to ignore things that we always have. We only realize how precious they are when they were taken away from us. I'm sure that many people already miss the days that they can just leave the house and go to work. One question I hope my audience can think for a little bit is, when you are away from the social interactions and take off labels, do you still like who you truly are? Isolated time is a good time to have some self-reflections. Okay, thanks for listening today. Welcome to connect with me via LinkedIn or email. I'd like to answer any questions or start some new dis discussions. 
Hope this difficult time will pass soon and please take care. I hope you all are healthy and inspired today. Good luck. Okay, thanks for listening. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Thank so, you. It's so interesting to see a, a report from the boots on the ground. Um, <laughs> yes, I, I even still have the Pecha Kucha the oh. book from 2016, <laughs> and yeah, Astro gave me as a as a gift. So, oh, so it's really fun to um, be one of the previous uh, Pecha Kucha staff and share this experience. All right, uh, but you touched also on a on a really interesting point, which is. Uh, uh, you know, um, the the hierarchy and the status and the titles of people, uh, you know, just like uh, when we all are here on the screen, we're all kind of uh, the same. And somehow uh, Pichakcha has always done that, uh, you know, it's kind of a, whether you're really famous or 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 a student who who's uh, who's done his first pachakcha, you know, it's it's uh, it's so leveling, and uh, and therefore uh, it it allows for 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 you to be much more true to yourself, I think. Uh, and then go, going forward, uh, I think uh, Chantel was saying uh, what was uh, reminding us all: uh, uh, who are you, or no, who, who, who yeah, who are you? That's right. Yeah, who we uh, are. And when I saw Chantal's work, I was really thinking, oh, that, that's also a point I want to say. And during this special time, yeah, because we are all at home right now and we are, most people are with their families. And so we don't have that much social interactions and we don't have other labels. So it's a good right. time to think about like yeah. who we are. I totally loved all those goldfish. Aren't they amazing? <laughs> wow. Oh, yeah, I took that amazing. photo. I took that photo like a few days ago, like when I went out. So now people are allowed to go out, um, but a face mask is required, and people need to scan the code. If you have the green code, you can go to public places. Right, right. So, so that's okay. like a that's like a like a sign that everything is like back to life again. So I so I took the photo. Wow, well, and it's it's well, it's so great. First of all, to get a first hand. Uh, uh, you know, first-hand news from somebody in Wuhan, and uh, <laughs> that it's that, that you you look exactly the same as you did before, <laughs> and, <you>. <laughs> uh, <laughs> even though you have been trapped in on your trampoline for for seventy six <laughs> days. But no, it's it's a really fascinating story, and I think one of the things that resonated uh, uh, with with me, and we talked about this with uh, with uh, the event last night, uh, last week with the UK, was that that countries are kind of outdated, and we're talking about cities. And cities is a big thing for protection. We're city-based, we're 1,227 cities. We don't care about countries, we don't care about borders, but cities are gonna become more and more important. And this is an issue that, it, that was in Wuhan or is an issue in New York. And, 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 and the fact that it's America or China is, is for, for me is, and I think for, for all of us, is unimportant. And I think that uh, uh, hopefully these, 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 these borders can be dissolved, but the cities are gonna become the strongest things in the world going forward. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Nana. Any question? <laughs> yeah, go on. I can unmute anybody. Just press your space bar if you want to talk. Um, some, yeah, I have it, I've got a question. Have... So I've got a question from YouTube, but you go first. Oh, I have a question for you. Um, um, how, you know, how did you keep your mind in a positive place, not knowing whether this was going to last a month, two months, or six months? So actually, I was like reading news. So everybody was really just confused because there was no end date. Actually, in the beginning, my dad said maybe it will be two weeks uh, because they can just like keep the sick people in the hospital or other facilities. So in two weeks, so people should get symptoms. So if you have, if you're sick, then then people would know in two weeks. But then turns out it just um, the date, the quarantine date was just extended. So personally. Um, I was following news in the beginning, but later and but later actually I was away from social media for a while because um, on one side it's good that people can connect on social media, but also um, for people um, for, for a lot of people it, it also creates a lot of anxiety. So we are seeing people dying, we are seeing other people are, are saying are, are sharing their like sadness. 
So personally, I just stay away from social media for a while and focusing on like study things and focusing on my personal project, focusing on talking with families, with relatives, uh, with friends. So I think it's a good, it's one good way is to focus on yourself, focus on your own life. And it's, real, it's, it's definitely great to, re, to connect with the world, but sometimes we need a little bit more um, isolated time to keep our mind in a positive way. Um, a question from YouTube here. Um, do you feel safe when you're outside, somebody asked? Uh, actually, I feel pretty safe because um, in Wuhan, so, uh, in Wuhan, because it's like the center of or, or like beginning place for this outbreak. So actually, the quarantine was really strict and there are a lot of regulations. So and oh, so everybody followed the rules. So nobody refused to wear a mask. So people are all wear a mask and people are, and we are really uh, cautious. So, so I think that's uh, my said, um, when you are in a dangerous place, you're paying more attention to your environment right. and you will be more cautious. So. And how about for a city, you said it's 11.6 million people. Well, what about the food and, and distribution of food? I, this is one of the biggest fears in Tokyo that suddenly there's gonna be no food coming into the city and everything is here, you know, it's, the delivery is just, just in time. How, how, how was your food supplies and things like that? Um, so I think that's, uh, uh, so the food, it was not really a big problem here because actually the central government of China, they, um, the, they arranged of other provinces, other provinces like other states to help Wuhan, to help Hubei okay. province. So, so actually there were a lot of donation of vegetable, of other groceries from other, other cities, other province. So that's how, that's how they solved this problem. So there are, there are trains to, from other cities just to deliver groceries to Wuhan. Right, right, amazing. And I just want to, just want to put a plug at the end there that, that this, so Dana made this presentation online in Wuhan. She voiced it through the web browser and then shared it on our website. Super, super easy to do. And I think that's uh, what, if, if, if anybody out there would like to make a presentation and, and, and share it about their experiences, you just go to the Protractor website, hit create, and uh, upload 20 images, voice and share them, but hashtag them for Chakra Inspire. And um, uh, we, we'll be really pleased to share your presentations about your experiences around the world. But Dana, thank you so much. Um, really, really amazing. And uh, Thanks lovely, for inviting lovely to see me. you. I'm, I'm happy to see everyone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Lana. Okay. Uh, yes, thank you, Dana. Okay, Eddie. For sure, finally, right? <laughs> um, oh, Brian? Okay. Eddie Sellover uh, has over 30 years of experience in brand and marketing communications, helping corporations and individual leaders express their stories. Hold on, sorry. So sorry. I'm having my own technical <laughs> difficulties here. Um, express their stories in helping corporations and individuals express their stories in ways that are more relevant, credible, and impactful. As a speech writer and public speaker, he is a two-time winner of the Cicero Speech Writing Award, and his TED Talk, How Pecha Kucha Changed My Life, has been viewed over 80,000 times. Since 2010, Eddie has been organizer uh, and host of Pecha Kucha Orlando, which has won international recognition as well as several awards for its contribution to Orlando's arts communities, community. Uh, his work with Pecha Kucha Orlando Magazine recognized as one of the 50 most powerful people in Orlando. That's so cool. Eddie, whenever you're ready. I just wanna say before I start, uh, you know, how hard it's gonna to be to follow all these other presenters, one thing so. Thanks for putting me at the end, wow. Um, and Dana, that was amazing um, to be able to, to see into your experience there, wow. And um, I just wanna to say to you that I also have the book. Here it is. Good. That's your book, yeah, yep. Um, yeah, so this talk is- uh, You're all getting complimentary books by the end of this presentation, by the way. I just wanted to put that out there. I got mine. All right, um, I'm ready when you are, Brian. Let's do it. Let's do it.
So I joined a meditation class a few years ago. It was held in a quiet room every Sunday morning. Our teacher, Jamie, would lead the class for an hour. About half that time was discussion with time for questions. And at the end, we would say namaste, which means the divine in me sees and recognizes the divine in you. But for most of the time, we just sat cross-legged on the cushion, eyes closed. The only thing we had to do was focus on our breath as it moved in and out. If you notice the thought, drop it, go back to the breath. In, out, in, out. And guess what? This turned out to be really, really hard. Trying to sit still on a cushion for an entire half hour. Don't scratch that itch. Hey, I think I left my keys in the car. Maybe it was the front room. Uh, I really gotta make some progress on my to-do list. Um, yesterday, when I had that fight with my boss, I should have, nope, back to the breath. But the thoughts kept coming, you know? Sometimes I'd realize with a shock that I'd forgotten my breath entirely and I'd gone away somewhere on this long trail of thoughts. And what is the point of this? And where is that fucking inner peace this is supposed to be bringing me? And then one day, Jamie said this amazing thing. He said, every time you notice yourself having thoughts, instead of focusing on your breath, you're going to think you failed at meditation. But that is exactly the moment you've succeeded, the moment that you notice your thoughts and you drop them. See, it turns out that the object of meditation is not inner peace after all. The object is to start noticing your thoughts, how they're actually like a broken record or an endless tape loop, often pretty negative. I need more of this. I got to get away from that. I'm so anxious. I'm so bored. It's those other people's fault. It's not like, it's not like I'm ever going to be able to stop having those thoughts. Good luck with that. But you know, as I began to notice them and drop them over and over, a really interesting gap started to open up between my unskillful thoughts and me, the observer of all that thinking. And I began to see my thinking like waves on a choppy sea, like this churning surface, my reaction to what's happening, my endless rehashing of the past or rehearsing for the future. But down under that, way down deep, I realized there was another part of me, calm, undisturbed, peaceful. And from this calm, undisturbed place, I could stop and observe. And that's what they call mindfulness, staying in the present moment and simply watching with patient curiosity, noticing things I'd never really seen before from this place of incredible freedom and peace. So one time the Dalai Lama went to Manhattan and 200,000 people came to hear him speak. And a reporter asked him, hey, what do you think of New York City? Meaning the crowds, the noise, the chaos. And the Dalai Lama smiled and he said, yeah, I find it a very peaceful place. And now in the fourth month of a worldwide pandemic, it's literally true. New York actually is a very peaceful place. The world has slowed down. Like Jamie's students on the cushions were all being forced to sit still. And guess what? It's really hard. But like Matt kind of pointed out, with all this calming down, the result is a kind of unexpected mindfulness. As we've been separating from constant thoughts and activity with a future we can't predict, you know, maybe we're starting to notice things we never really saw before because we never had the opportunity before. For one thing, with all of our activity slowing down, you probably heard that the earth itself is starting to heal. Seismic activity is down, noise in the ocean that disrupts sea life is down, emissions are down by 20%, carbon dioxide is down 40%. The difference can actually be seen from space. And all that pollution is the byproduct of economic systems that really don't work so well. I mean, yeah, they work great for what they're built for, our insatiable greed, but they're working better for some of us than others. And maybe we're starting to see that when you harm some of us, you're really harming all of us. And because any one of us can get or transmit COVID-19, we're seeing that our boundaries and borders are meaningless. So the politics of blaming some people, scapegoating and shutting them out, maybe we can see that for what it is, an old negative tape loop that we can stop listening to. 
closer to home, I'm noticing my own habits. I would like to tell you that I've spent this quarantine reading great literature, working out and detoxing. But in fact, my ego seems to want coffee, chips and beer. And I notice very often it gets what it wants. So I'm working on that. One thing I've really been noticing is how much I need other people. How sweet it is just to hear someone's voice look into their eyes. Uh, I'm in a men's group. And when we had our very first Zoom meeting and all those other faces popped up, we just sat there grinning to each other. And I'm, I'm also realizing how much beauty is all around. Only I wasn't seeing it because I was, you know, busy. Um, this is a picture of the gardenia tree in my own front yard right next to the driveway. I never stopped to look at it before. I mean, really look at it. And now I feel like I could stare at it for hours. So there are benefits to this quarantine. And sometimes I worry that when it's all over, we'll forget and go back to how it used to be. But there's something I learned from meditation. Once you've seen the light, you actually can't go back to your old ways of reacting. It's actually not possible to become less enlightened. So when we do come back together, so grateful to touch and reconnect and see each other in person, I'm hoping the insights we've gained during this time will help us help each other to start creating a better, kinder, saner, more mindful world. Namaste. Namaste. Yes, that gardenia tree really smells very, very nice as well, I'm, I'm sure. Um, well, the gardenias on my balcony. Uh, I'm not hearing you guys amazing. if you're talking to me. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> no, I unmuted. Can you hear me, Eddie? No, I can, no, I can hear you. Oh, okay. So, oh, something oh. happened. There you are. Oh, okay, okay. I was, uh, I was saying, Eddie, that that gardenia tree, those flowers, they have a really amazing, beautiful smell as well. And uh, don't worry, that tree will be outside your uh, your door anyway, uh, whether it's over or not. So, uh, we, I don't think we'll forget. <laughs> You know, that tree is literally right next to the driveway and I drive past it and it hits my car sometimes. And I'm like, oh, stupid tree. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it was only during this that I stopped and I really like, I had the time to kind of, you know, look at it. Mm. Yeah. I can I think... completely relate to meditating, but not really meditating. <laughs> that made me <laughs> chuckle. I think what resonated was was some of the things you said, especially, you know, if somebody had said to us, you've got to shut the world down for, for two months, it, everybody would say it was impossible, you know, and they say it's impossible to do, you know, for climate change, you've got to reduce emissions. So people are talking about 20, 20, 20, 30, 20, 40. What about next week, you know, and, and we can do it. And I think this has been a, a really amazing exercise in a way about how we can make global change instantly you know and uh um maybe maybe so much the the impetus for the talk was my realization that you know the first few weeks and months of meditating were excruciating because it was so difficult to just sit still physically and then very difficult to to you know stop myself from thinking and and that the quarantine reminds me of that the sort of the difficulty at first of not doing all those things that were so important. Yeah. But you get over it. I'm mute, I'm mute. It's amazing how, how we are um, able to, to cope with this. You wouldn't think that you'd be able to shut the, uh, shut the world down and just, just do that. Um, you know, it's awesome. Yeah, I think we that, that the, the, the fact that we can get, you know, we can get through this, and we, the airlines might just struggle through, and everybody's going to. We're working how to cope and not pay our rent or whatever we do. To, but we will get through it, and we will survive. And it's it, it's just it's 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 how we've adapted in the last uh, two, three, four, five five weeks is really uh, phenomenal. So maybe uh, hold on, going. Hold on. Yeah, you can speak. 
May, maybe going forward, um, there is a lesson learned and uh, maybe there is going to be a new holiday every year called Meditation Months, you know, where everybody has to stay home and, uh, and, uh, and you know, be mindful and uh, catch up on themselves and, uh, and the beauty around them. Um, might be a good idea. Meditation Months. I'm in. I, I'm joining. I'm, in. I'm joining. I'm there. Yeah. Fantastic job, Eddie. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Um, before I introduce our last presenter, do we have any questions that popped up um, online, Brian? Uh, I think we can probably head in to head into the next presenter and maybe circle back on them at the end. Okay. And you have a new location. Very bright and pretty back. Okay. Yeah, okay. we, we keep it nice, we keep it nice. <laughs> All right, our last presenter of the evening, I like to pronounce Peta, Peta Exley. <laughs> Peter I Exley. Just wait till I get it to laugh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Those Brits Brian, pronounce Lana really well, you know that, you know. <laughs> okay. Okay, so Peter Exley has established an internationally recognized practice of architecture for children, families, and communities, elevating the standards of design for learning and play environments. He is a co-founder of Architecture is Fun, a Chicago-based architecture design and consulting firm, and was recently elected to the 2020 Vice President and 2021 President-elect of the American Institute of Architects. Cool. Peter, whenever you're ready. Well, thanks, Lana. So um, let's go, Brian. So here's a story about the choices we make and the events that influence them. Uh, two years on from the World's Columbian Exposition, America's first automobile race started from the Midway Plaisance in Chicago's Jackson Park, which had been the, the heart of the 1893 World's Fairgrounds. Only two vehicles completed the 54 mile round trip that took place on a snowy day like today in Chicago. A gas powered vehicle won. An electric car was the runner up. And in that moment, the motor car was introduced to America. The electric car is a forgotten footnote and an accidental choice powers the 20th century with fossil fuels. About a hundred paces south of the starting line for the race, stands the site for the Obama Presidential Center, a beacon intended to commemorate America's 44th presidential legacy and act as an economic engine and catalyst for revitalizing surrounding neighborhoods where inequity and struggle are rampant. The Obama project has been controversial, mostly because of the absence of what many in the community see as a lack of true engagement. But the School of the Art Institute of Chicago I challenge my graduate students in a quest for equity and justice for human and ecological health through inclusive architecture and design is part of an Andrew Pfeiffer's solution. In our normal world, the culmination of these design explorations is the critique. Here, my faculty colleague Tracy Weil engages in conversations with student Rula Zuroa in a panel held in an architect's office in downtown Chicago. While Jesse LaFree another faculty colleague inquires of Brenta Guau. Appropriately, these students share their work in the company of Mies van der Rohe and Bertrand Goldberg's projects. That shadow is part of the responsibility and privilege of training and practicing as an architect in Chicago. It's all firsthand. At least it used to be. Here's the new normal class yesterday at SAIC. The novelty have been stacked like the Brady Bunch has made way for the serious business of creative practice and invention at one of the most respected schools of art and design in the world. Yesterday's field trip was supposed to begin at the start line for the infamous, infamous automobile race and conclude under the eaves of Frank Lloyd Wright's Roby House through the courtyards and architecture of the University of Chicago. We did it via Google Earth. My faculty colleagues, Tracy Weil and Jesse LaFree, are both Pachacacha alumni who graduated during the last Great Recession and had, a few and had few job prospects in their chosen field. When they entered the workplace, 
they very quickly realized that it was necessary to have a plan B. A decade or so on from that, they're now respected members of the design community and have engaged in the, as leaders in their own right. Jesse has taken the opportunity to travel to 58 countries, win a Golden Gloves Boxing Championship, also managing to transition from technical assistant to prime architecture jobs and teaching. So that's part of a plan. And with that plan, there's a plan B. Tracy's alternate career leveraging an architectural education led straight into two Obama presidential campaigns as part of the, his design team and a role in organizing for action a nonprofit community project advocating for the agenda of the former president. Here's an instance of design and advocacy for social good, designing healthy communities, if you will. Sound, sound topical? The choices that plan B and plan Bs that Jesse and Tracy had in their arsenal may be as elusive as an in-person graduation ceremony will be to the class of 2020. The smartest, best educated class of creative professionals may not even have a service industry job as a backup. I'm deeply involved in the leadership of the American Institute of Architects. In the last month, we've pivoted for our outreach, knowledge and advocacy efforts towards responding to COVID-19 and to supporting the work of our members in service to our communities. I'm particularly proud of this white paper my colleagues have created to address the pandemic through the adaptation of existing buildings into alternative care sites. This is a cross-discipline effort led by an architect leader in public health policy. It's a document that's helping architects, governors, mayor, and healthcare administrators make informed decisions that are helping to save lives. If your community is preparing for a pandemic event, here's the tool that will help you evaluate if a building can be an effective uh, handler of patient care. This has now been in use since March. It was prepared over a seven day period during a, an alert phase of this pandemic. Ideally, we would have had it ready during the inter-pandemic phase. We know that for next time. One of the striking things about our response as architects to COVID-19 has been the realization that the World Health Organization had not considered shelter among the factors of preparedness for a pandemic. Food, water, telecom, transport, finance, law and order, defense and health are all there, but shelter is not. While we're in the response and hopefully soon in the recovery period of pandemic risk management, we're concurrently in the preparatory and already response period for weather events that strain our infrastructure and built environment. The time for enormous investment in human and ecological health is nigh. COVID-19 has been an accelerated analogy to the looming crisis with our climate. The time for unified dedication to environmental stewardship, making that choice is now. During the, work, the Great Depression, the Works Progress Administration chose to make monumental investment in America's infrastructure and arts, and it's our societal responsibility to do the same now. The WPA was a big project. This one is bigger. The gasoline-powered vehicle that won that race in Chicago in 1895 has a lot to answer for. We've spent a century and a quarter since relying on fossil fuels, and the outcome is not good. It's time right now to make a choice again. And as part of the world's largest design organization dedicated to design, it's time for us all to show what the world, uh, show the world what design can do. We must make an investment in the students that are graduating right now. Thank you. Oh, good, thank you. Um, I'm exhausted. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's late for us. Uh, Mark and Astrid, I see you're together. Would you like to unmute and pop in here? Uh, let me just hold on one second. Uh, you're unmuted. Uh, okay. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I just kind of ran out of juice on my laptop without realizing. And um, so, so, so the rule isn't just uh, the rule is in the office. Uh, you can drive in if you can in your car, but when you're in the office, you got to wear masks. That's uh, that's that's why they're on. We're obeying by the the, K, the KDA rules. But you, you know, some people when they talk very loud, there's all these droplets kind of <laughs> emanating. Yeah. Where's your mask, Peter? Have you got your have you got your beer mat mask handy? Yeah. <laughs> we have to avoid speaking moistly. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So yeah, I think. <laughs> Yeah, kind of just uh, that just reminded me. Uh, uh, Mark came in one morning with a with a mask, and it was pretty brown around him. So what did you do? And uh, <laughs> in in his absent mindedness, he tried to drink his coffee with the mask on. <laughs> anyway, uh, but but going back to Peter's serious, uh, very serious presentation, I think architectural education is obviously going to change massively. Now. All these things are just dawning on us that you know that we hadn't. I hadn't really thought about that. What, what are our student projects going to be, and and, and what 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 are what are what are students learning at this at this in this moment about yeah. about life about the world? Yeah. Yeah, and the the students that are graduating, um, you know, I I introduced Tracy Weil and Jesse ten years ago. They actually had a choice in the service industry or as an alternate practice. Um, there, there are no jobs right right now, and and we'd be spectacularly optimistic if we thought that the, the jobs that are uh, the, the class of 2021 and 22 that the internships that if, if they were going to exist they've all been rescinded we really need to make an investment um, as designers uh, as, as communities as, as leaders in the field this is our responsibility right now to uh, to support to advocate to reach out to our elected officials to to support something like the works progress. Yeah, that's another thing I hadn't thought about either as well about internships. I mean, we, um, you know, and yeah, I mean, it is a really big, big issue. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, I, I'd always like to think that architects are, are kind of, and designers are, are problem solvers, really. And, uh, you know, if you put your mind to it, you can, you can, do it you can make it you can solve it so i'd like to think that you know architecture students architecture is a very very broad sense you know and uh um maybe it's more about the skill stack i, I think that i think there are a lot of a lot of parallels here with the uh, tohoku earthquake which is the nine nine years ago yeah um and that came that came pretty pretty sharply after the lehman shock things were really tough here in japan and then uh, the whole, you know, Japan went on pause for three months after the nu 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 nuclear fallout I I issues. And, st and architecture students kind of changed and they became, they started running small cafes and engaging with the community more. They all survived, they all got through, but it's actually changed architectural design as well in Japan. Yeah, I mean, it's really different today from 10 or 15 years ago. And it's definitely more about commu being community activators and activating people and not really design. The spaces become secondary to the activity the architects are, uh, are, are bringing together. And we are, as architects, we are like directors or conductors and we bring people together in spaces. And um, yeah, it's, it's going to be super interesting how it goes forward. Now we've got to tell them to stay away from each other. <laughs> <laughs> no, so. Um, yeah, yeah, very interesting. There was a uh, somebody. There was a question for Eve on uh, YouTube. Yeah. yeah, I think he can see that. I don't want to go back there. Actually, oh, um, okay. it's, it's, oh, it's working on Facebook. Oh, great. Um, yeah, thank you, Peter. That was uh, really uh, thought provoking. Um, does anybody else have any comments or, or things for Peter? And, and congratulations on becoming uh, next next year's uh, American History of Architects Global President. That's amazing. Uh, mm. For a Brit, it's not bad. P Peter. <laughs> Peter and I met, Peter and I met at the first day of architectural school when we were 18. And um, he's, you know, we've never had a bad word. And uh, he's the only person I asked to run for Traction Night anywhere in the world. And he does a fantastic job, him and Torsten and the team in Chicago running a great, great Protection Night there. Thank you so much. And his well, daughter, Emma, very... my, my, my goddaughter runs Protection New York and Brooklyn. So thank you to the Exley family. The very first uh, president of the AIA was also a Brit. Richard Upjohn. So um, that's interesting. Huh. <laughs> yeah. What, Very good. There is some precedent for it. <laughs> Mark, can you Mark, can you tell the story of how um, wasn't it Peter who started the the first like spin-off Pecha Kucha in Chicago? Isn't that right? Yeah, I mean, Peter's run a number of really amazing events uh, with the AIA and all sorts of different. I, I can't remember how many uh, things he's. Uh, Run, but really amazing events in really amazing venues as 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 well. So, um, have you got an anecdote there, Peter? <laughs>
Well, well no, I don't. It's a million. I'm, I've done a million of them. <laughs> and and in that it was your college um, friendship that you know has lasted all these years and and helped uh, I mean, uh, the, support the, Petra, yeah. Petra, right? Yeah, yeah. The, the, the big thing is we're in 1,200 cities and, and, it, and we've never asked anyone except Peter to, right. to run an event, yeah. That's, so I feel a little that's, bit, uh, that's, 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 the, uh, that's the story out of, out of all the cities in the world. They've all, they've all yeah. found the- that, That's uh, 14 college. years of my life, I'm never gonna get back. <laughs> 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 Thanks, man. <laughs> but thank you for that, it was really, uh, really amazing. Um, Brian, yeah. uh, Brian well, I, I just uh, that brings our presentations to an end. I want to thank everybody for I know it was like we, we, we pulled this off in a, in a week's time. I mean, so to anybody who's out there on the live stream, um, take a look at what, you know, a ragtag team of uh, people managed to accomplish with a little bit of ingenuity, a little bit of online tools and, um, you know, a lot of passion. So I want to thank everybody for coming and being a part of this. Sorry for the hiccups along the way. I think we should officially sort of like give, our, give all of ourselves, unmute everybody and give all of ourselves an, a round of applause for doing a fantastic job. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for everybody who came online. And I think we can hang out. I mean, unless we can hang out a little bit if, if we want to, but if, if you guys want to, if anybody online wants to take off, I think that's the end of our night, Mark. you have any closing yeah. comments? Um, thank you, everybody, for I've oh, but for the right one. I really don't like these things. Um, but it has. But it, <laughs> I will say, I just want to say one thing about the mask. You know what? It does make a difference, and it's totally, it's totally slowed the spread here. Uh, it's a thing we wear normally here. If you've got the flu in the winter months, you wear a mask. Uh, they do. They really. Tokyo's not been that badly affected, and I, I think because everybody wears these, so uh, that's a top. That's a top tip, but no, no hugging and kissing, just bowing, no shaking hands. That all really, really helps. Anyway, that's my, uh, that's my top COVID tip. But I did want to say thank you to everybody with so many people. And I know it's very late with you guys in New York. I think Chantel's dropped off because it it's 12 o'clock or one o'clock in the morning there. I want to say a huge thank you to Carl uh, for, for joining, being, uh, being always there when, when, when we ask. But for ev ev everybody, every time we ask, people always step, step up. So. Um, thanks to Carl, thanks to Asby. Um, again, amazing that your work you've done before is coming back around again and again um, and to, to, to help in this situation too, yeah. Um, and I, I should name everybody by, by name, but I, I'm probably gonna forget. But thank you all so much. And we're gonna be trying to do this every week, believe it or not, and we might be doing one in the UK next, uh, next Thursday. Um, we also want to say a big thank you to Dizine uh, because they're hosting this on their new um, um, vir virtual, virtual design festival, their VDF. And um, please go across and look what's going on there. They're, they're doing a really great job, as, as I said before, because degree shows and design weeks can't happen. Uh, they're, they're, um, they're, they're, they've set up this festival which started yes, yesterday and will run for a couple of months. So interesting people are talking on uh, uh, the virtual design festival, uh, really kind of uh, like we talk right now. So it's a great opportunity to uh, listen to people you otherwise would never had a chance to uh, uh, hear talk in, uh, in such a free manner. What, what we did last week, actually, we just went round and asked everybody if they've got a sentence or two to, st to, 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 to say, which I think may be worthwhile. So if you want to just ask Lana, if you go around the, the, the number of people on your, as you see them on your screen. Yeah. Um, well, if you don't mind, I'll start. I really want to thank you guys. I mean, really the information that I've learned tonight, I, I love Pecha Kucha regardless, but the information I've learned tonight is just mind blowing. I mean, it's really a treasure. So um, thank you for your time. Um, Asby, why don't we start with you? Uh, yeah, I really appreciate having had the opportunity uh, today. And um, maybe I should plug in my earphones. <laughs> um, and want to encourage everybody to team up. I mean, we're really at a stage now where we know we can do this uh, virtually online distributed. Uh, it's working pretty smoothly, much smoother than we thought we would. Um, and I guess psychically, you know, mentally, emotionally, I'm really valuing sanctuary, uh, the notion that there are places that are going to keep me safe. And 
as Mark was talking about the changes after uh, 3.11 in Japan and design, I think maybe we'll see more changes uh, towards this notion of what is a secure home? What does it mean to be home? Uh, what is all, what were the values that that brings to us? So um, yeah, looking to try to make positive changes out of a terrible situation. And thanks to all of you. Thank you, Asby. Eddie. Yeah, I, I, I just have to say, I really felt it was such an honor to be a part of this and to be included in this lineup. I want to thank you for that um, first. And everybody was incredible. It was, it was, it felt very, um, it, it's hard to put into words, but it felt like, it, it felt like a global event. You know, there were so many perspectives from so many places, so many people actually doing something about this. Uh, in so many different ways, that that was really uh, very moving, actually. Um, and I, I'm sure that I, I just want to shout out to Brian. I'm sure it felt pretty nerve wracking uh, getting yeah. it all together, uh, but it it what it probably felt ten times worse to you than it actually came off to us. It really was a very smooth thing, um, and it was an easy thing to be a part of. And it gives me a lot of uh, hope about doing uh, our next Pachakshi night here online um, in a few weeks. So uh, I'll have uh, some pro tips for you for sure. Yes, I bet you will. <laughs> I'm going to bring you into my meetings. Sure. Yeah. Um, but yes, anyway, thank you. No, thank you, Eddie. I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. And I agree, Brian. Um, amazing job. And you are next. Are you Dana? Me? <laughs> yeah. Oh, Brian. Sorry, Brian. Oh, oh. I'll, pa I'll pass it over to Mike. I've had said I've had my share of thank yous, but yeah, Dana, take it over. Okay. okay. Um, I, I hope everybody stay positive. Wuhan did it. So I hope everywhere else can we will we will join hands and fight this difficult time together. And also stay positive, focus on self-improvement, do some self-reflection. After after this special time and we can run further and go to more places. Thank you, Dana. Uh, Eve. Hi, well, one positive I see is what we're doing right now, right here, which is um, doing a virtual conference. All of us get uh, invited all around the world to, uh, to speak and you know, get on a plane sometimes um, halfway across the world to, uh, to give a talk. And this is, this is um, this is the kind of positive change that that hopefully will remain, which is um, the lowest carbon footprint uh, conference probably I've ever attended by far. Um, and, um, and I feel like I've met you all probably more than we would have uh, done at a conference where you end up running around and being pulled right and left and yeah, that's uh, true. Uh, running back to the airport and, and flying back home, um, coming home, you know, completely jet lagged and, um, and often coming back with a couple of uh, viruses too. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I hope we do a lot more of uh, these types of uh, gatherings and, and get a lot of, um, or voices, um, you know, on a, on a on a regular basis. This is this is something fun that I would I would probably do a lot more often than um, than than going to you know big conferences. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. thank you, Eve. That's such a good point. The time we travel with our commute, it's like ten feet for some of us. <laughs> but also, but also, <laughs> when 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 you're at a conference, you know, there's a there's a fantastic lineup of speakers. You might get a dinner. Uh, but then you're not in the room, you're being shunted around and pulled around to get on stage and off stage, and you don't actually meet any of the other speakers, you know, so this is a really great chance, actually, and also to see where they live and what's yeah. behind them, you know. <laughs> so, very yeah, good. It's a lot Thank, of fun. You. Thank you. Uh, Cameron, you're muted. Okay. No. Um, so, <laughs> positives. So, the thing about designers is we create simple solutions out of complex challenges, right? And, you know, we find ourselves in a critical situation where like we have a great urgency of now, there are things that need to be solved. And we have been trained to solve complex issues. And um, I know I rub people up the wrong way a lot in my industry, but, you know, 
the way I felt about it is, you know, you can either like jump head in and design for medical needs now, or you can wait and design memorials later. And I don't think we should be an industry that waits to design memorials. We should be an industry that goes full feet in, right? This is like the moment, right? Most of us have worked on architecture and design projects where the client just says, oh, it's gonna be another six months before we can do that. Oh, could you put that on hold for a year? And, and, and we just kind of like plod along. But, you know, I think in the, in, in the case of, you know, Carl and, and, and a few others, like design iterations is happening every two hours, right? It is, it is incredibly invigorating and there's an unbelievable sense mm -hmm. of people willing to help. And it's like mm -hmm. the best moment you can feel as a designer. So, I mean, if anyone's still up at 12.30 in the morning, uh, as I am in New York. Um, <laughs> Sorry, Governor. Uh, Oh, that's all right. I'm, I'm like, you know, I, I will tell a little story. Okay. And hopefully he's not watching. Um, I happened to be helping one of my investors in his house the week that this all unfolded. And um, the day, the day they shut down New York, I became an American citizen. The yes, Monday I, saw. I launched a company and my investor basically said, because I, I was going to move to, I was going to move out of the city, and my investor said, "Why don't you just stay in my house for a couple of days and look after it?" And so I've been stuck in my investor's house for a month, which has been very <laughs> nice. But those who think that this is my typical background and that humanitarian <laughs> architects live like this, no. <laughs> so so it's been, I, I've actually done, you know, fairly well in terms of space for the last few weeks. <laughs> but thank you for your time, Cameron. It was a really lovely presentation. Thank you so much. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so that's um, our round robin. And I guess we want to just thank everyone for listening in. And um, Yeah, and we're going to do, I don't know if Carl, uh, Carl, are you still there? I'm not sure if you're still on or you've, you've dropped off uh, there. I can see you. I think you're still on. We're going to do, I think we're going to try and do a group. At the end of Projection Night in Tokyo, we always do a group photo. So I think we're going to try and do a group photo uh, with everybody waving or whatever. You, we normally do a little kind of, Hands in the air, bands I think. Uh, but I think I've got to get my uh, camera up and ready. Hold on. I, of course, the face ID doesn't work when you've got your mask on. So I've got to put my damn password in. Hold on a second. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. okay. So um, I've got to get my hand in. Here we go. <laughs> that's nice. Good. Three, two. <laughs> hold on. I've got lights in it. Oh my goodness Yay. me. Hey, hey. <laughs> Three, two, one. Yay. Thank you, everybody. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you all so much. Uh, that draws to, uh, to the close of our, our second Pachacta Inspire the World uh, global event. It's been really fantastic to join everybody together from Wuhan to Tokyo to New York to Chicago to Benton Harbor to San Francisco. Thank you all so much. Lana, and, yeah. and a huge yeah, thank yeah. you to Lana for, for, for pulling this together and helping us uh, curate the team and uh, for your, your fantastic emceeing skills. So uh, thank you so, so much. Yeah. And thank you for running for Jack tonight in Benton Harbor. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thanks so much, everyone. Yeah. Hey, Lana and everybody. So long, everybody. Thanks. OK, good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good morning. Good night. 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 Good night.